Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 10 of another gaming podcast. I believe it is April 6, 2013. We've turned 10, and I am one of your hosts, the Laggy Gamer. <laughs> that laugh threw me off, but we're going to roll with it. Joined by my fellow co host, Dustin Christ. What's going on, Dustin? Where's my fucking balloons? If we're turning ten, if we're turning this into a birthday party, where's my fucking balloons? Your balloons, your ice cream cake, I want it all. Yeah. You can even cry at the end of this if we want, because it's our tenth birthday party. My party, and I'll cry if it, I want to. Hi, everyone. And we, and we're joined by another co-host, Doomway. It's Chance. What's going on, Doomer? It's my party, and I'll cry if I want to. <laughs> Was that um, really his voice? Yes, yes, it was. I have a awesome falsetto. Um, I can, yeah, whatever. Hello. Oh, Justin dude. Timberlake, watch out. <laughs> with the falsetto. I'm bringing Doom back. That, that, that was that was very, yeah, uh, oh, oh. that was some Doom there. Oh, yeah. And we are uh, glad to be joined by our guest today, T.G. Apuleius. Apuleius. I'm sorry if I'm butchering the name, T.G., but what's going on, man? Hey, how's it going, fellas? Happy to be here on the big 1-0. All right. Hurrah. The big 1-0. Something Who's just sounds wrong? weird by hearing the big 1-0. But it's awesome. <laughs> we're, we're, we're getting we're in the double digits. We're getting old now. Yeah. Seasoned warriors. You have to start thinking about so, high school and stuff. <laughs> funny, thing about high school, before, funny thing about high school, I always thought that shit was going to be like Saved by the Bell. And it was not <laughs> like Saved by the Bell. I wanted to sit on a trash can with my friends and not go to class. <laughs> and it was nothing like that. I just wanted to go to the max, <clears throat> have a shake or something, you know, a shake and a basket of fries, <laughs> and a magic trick. <laughs> I wouldn't mind just a hangout spot. That would have been nice. Yeah, one yeah, hangout diner by the school. Yeah, we didn't do anything. We just went home after school. <laughs> yeah. It was boring. The, the ten people that were in your school, chance. <laughs> yeah, all ten of them. All ten of them. My graduating class was forty students, and uh, <laughs> yeah, I knew every one of them fairly well. And uh, we were a boring crew. If you didn't play sports or were a farmer, you were kind of an outcast. Sports <laughs> or farm. A lot of them were both. There was some, some double dipping. Yeah. But uh, for Cal me, tipping. I was neither. Cal tipping is an official sport now. <laughs> for anyway. me, I was neither, so I just went home. We are, we are, we are already off on a tangent. Yep. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Steven, realize let's, back let's let, our, <laughs> let's let our guest uh, tell us why he's started his YouTube, got into YouTube, and all sorts of that cool jazz. So, TG, take it away, man. All right. Uh, well, it's been a few years now, um, off and on. Uh, I think probably about 2010 is when I put the first video up, which I think was a uh, collection video for Warcraft before it went to the MMO side. And ever since then, just uh, really the discussion has been carrying it. You put a video up, people start commenting, and uh, you get the regular commenters, and so yeah, these days pretty much just to uh, keep the conversation going with people like Snus Tastic and uh, Bosu Seventy Seven. I've talked to them off and on for years, and um, I'll you know just put gameplay footage up, uh, archival stuff, interviews, um, intros, things like that. Just you know whatever I get in off eBay, I'll record footage of and toss that up, and uh, just been going ever since. One thing well, that someone I who oh go on, Dessa. I was gonna say one thing I love that you used to do. Um, you used to get those like discs that you would get from your PC magazines, and you would like go through those. I, for some reason, I just I loved those because it was so. It just took me back to like the '90s. I don't know if you ran out of those or you just got sick of doing them. But oh, I, that, that was yeah. Those were interactive entertainment discs, and they only went for I want to say a year or a year and a half. And I have all but three of them, and they're really hard to find. I end up getting a lot on eBay of about a dozen of them. So that's where a lot of those came from. Was uh, from there. It was a Side project of Chips and Bits magazine from 1994. <laughs> yeah, they were they're it's just awesome. like they're so like 90s esque that it's just <laughs> very nostalgic to see stuff like that. A lot of O.J. Simpson references <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Monica Lewinsky. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> can't oh, forget her. Video. <laughs> <laughs> very cool, man. I uh, I I haven't been subscribed for too long. Maybe about I don't know, maybe like six months, something like that. When I really started um, getting getting into YouTube, but I just I just love your watching your pickup videos because they're not so dissimilar from mine. You know, you just show like the books you got and you know just kind of the stuff that you're into at that moment. You know, it's not just video games, and that's 
very, very cool because I'm like a supremely eclectic person and I just put throw, throw whatever up on my YouTube channel and hopefully somebody likes it. Um, but also I just love your gameplay videos too because it's like, it's not really like a, a let's play, you know, necessarily, you know, you just play, you know, for a while and then, and then there it is, you know, it's just really awesome. Like specifically, um, the one that you just did not too long ago, the, uh, Strike Suit Zero, I think is what it's called. You did that one. Mm -hmm. And I talked to you about yes. it very briefly. But that was just like a fun-looking game that I probably never would have heard of if you hadn't thrown it up there on that channel. So that's awesome. Yeah, basically until I do really bad, then I cut the footage off and uh, toss that up. <laughs> awesome. Now, is there someone who uh, particularly inspired you into wanting to make videos, or it's just something you said, you know what, I want to do this, so I'm going to do it? Uh, I guess it was uh, Snestastic. Uh, watching his, it was real laid back, and um, I saw what kind of built up around those of people commenting, and he had his regulars he would converse with, and I thought that looked like uh, you know a pretty good time. And Well, not just that, it's um, not many people around here I know still are into games, so I didn't have anyone to con you know talk about games with, so I don't, I don't really participate in forums or anything like that, so I figured I would just go the YouTube route, and that's uh, been pretty good. Awesome, and you have uh, you do a lot of variety of different uh, games and systems, and I enjoy that you actually touch in the PC stuff too, because you're into PC gaming, and not too many channels I watch uh, do a lot of PC stuff, unless it's indie stuff. But uh, I appreciate uh, you do yeah. your PC stuff as well. So, uh, what do you enjoy doing stuff for the most, or just a fan of everything? Uh, everything, but. I really like strategy games, and uh, that'd be on the PC side. And there's less and less of those nowadays, so uh, I try to grab those when I can. I'm a big fan of good old games. I grab a lot of the older stuff off of that. Um, Steam sales and Amazon sales. I end up uh, been pretty lucky so far in that a lot of the console titles ported over to PC have done real well, especially with the um, Xbox 360 wired controller. And so I have a decent gaming system, so I can get newer console titles for you know ten fifteen dollars off the steam sales so if it's not that then i pick up older titles off good old games so yeah a lot of stuff on the pc i enjoy old space simulators like x-wing and tie fighter i still play the original command and conquer the original red alert things like that awesome very awesome cool stuff. well should we go ahead and let him answer the big three you guys and get him out of the way <laughs> were you were you prepared for this one tg or Oh, one, one of them I'm pretty good on. Um, okay. uh, the other two I haven't thought too much on, but I'll, I'm going to give it a whirl. Well, here we go. Favorite game, favorite recording artist, and favorite movie. <laughs> go for it. Okay, let's see. Favorite game. I would say the most played game is um, Rome Total War. That's primarily through the mods. I've put hundreds and hundreds of hours into that. Um, Europa Barborum is probably the most played mod. I played the base game alone for about 200 hours off and on throughout the years, and then uh, Rome Total Realism, probably about 100, and Europa has just been an ongoing thing. I have one campaign I've been doing for about six months now that I go to off and on, so that's the most played. Uh, the, the game I like the most is tough. I would say, I really like um, what Virtua is Rome Fighter Total 5. War? I'm going to have to stop you. What is Rome Total War? Never heard of it. Oh, uh, well, Creative Assembly developed it. Uh, Sega purchased Creative Assembly, I think, year before last, and it is a massive uh, turn-based strategy game, uh, but when you fight, it takes place real-time on a battlefield, so you move your armies around. Um, you know, there's, I think starting off, there's three factions, and the more you play, the more you unlock. They have Shogun Total War, um, Medieval Total War, so they have a, a, the whole series encompasses from antiquity all the way to, I think, Fall of the Samurai is like the 18, 1812 or so. So, you know, depending on what your what time period you like, they have one for a little bit of everything. And they all pretty much operate the same way. You move your armies around the battlefield, and you have agents, so you can send spies or assassins, and um, you administer your towns that you conquer. So you set taxation, you set what you want to build, things like that. So epic strategy okay. games, I guess, with a little bit of both elements turn in real time. It's so tough for me to get into anything that big because it seems like there's so much going on. Are there different like uh, level difficulties for it to dumb it down more for you, so you don't got to focus too much on one thing in those type of games? Or, uh, yeah, for Rome primarily, there are uh, separate difficulty levels for the campaign map and for the battles themselves. You can click to arcade battles, which don't take. Um, I'm not sure what all variables they take out of it, but I I think it. Uh, 
think morale. And so a good example would be if you get hit from the flank with cavalry. Um, if you play regular, I think your your guys panic, run away. But if you play an arcade, they might be able to stand their ground longer. Um, you can also hire governors and just click for them to administer the cities for you, so you don't have to go to each one yourself if you're not a big fan of that element. So they they try to have different they have, uh, several difficulty levels for each style of game, and then within each style, uh, things to make it easier for you depending on what you do or do, don't enjoy. That's pretty cool. Dustin or Chance, you guys ever get into any type of RTS strategy games like that? Um, I played um, Age of Empires 2, I think, it, yeah, 2 a little bit back in the day. But I never really had a very strong, like, gaming PC, so I was never really a big, uh, like, <coughs> gaming PC person. But what I want to ask him was, because it seems like a lot of the uh, computer games that he plays, like Rome Total War... Or you did that big one on the guild, and you talked about the guild. <laughs> mm-hmm. It seems like they're very based in, like, history. And I know you're a big history buff. Do you think that's why you gravitate to those types of games? Because of your love of reading of history and things like that? Uh, originally for Rome, yes. But uh, for the guild, I don't really read too much into that. Well, I am now, as it happens. But uh, normally I don't read about that time period. I'm not sure why I enjoy the guild so much. When you play it, it's not that engaging. Yeah. But you can't stop because you know, once you unlock how to build, say, a top, then you think, okay, well, I'll play a little bit more. And then suddenly you unlock the ability to make a chair. And for some reason, <laughs> that's enough to keep you going because then you're going to earn a few dollars extra profit on the chair. And so then you want to kind of corner the chair market in Berlin. So I'm not sure why I like that game so much. But, uh, yeah, history will draw me in mostly for game, uh, for most games, but they don't really have to be set in any time period. I play a lot of sci-fi and, you know, uh, fantasy-inspired stuff, too. Because I was, I was thinking about that the other day because um, I went to Half Price Books, and they have you know, that big piece, used PC section there, and I saw a bunch of copies of the Guild, too. And I was like, I, I went to grab it because I was like, oh, you know, Apollea says that's a kind of a good... And I was like, oh, wait, he said 2 sucked. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah, two has none of the charm of the original. I don't know. I, the company ended up using an engine that they they spread across about five titles, so each title kind of looks and feels the same. Which there's another game, Spell Force, that used a similar engine for its follow up. That it just didn't have the charm as the original. The the original's got uh, better music. I like the visuals better, even though nowadays they're a little clunky. Um, it will crash on you, which is unfortunate. But, yeah, there's something about the flow of the original that I, I much prefer over the follow-up. And the follow-up has a few expansions, and I tried those, and, yeah, none of them really improved it all that much. So I'm a fan of the original, and the sequel's kind of real far back. I just I, I love the, the story of murder and revenge um, that you had with that game. It's just it, it seems like something that you could only get in that kind of a, a gaming universe. Like, I don't know how they would do that for a console title, really. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, the, when I record the footage because someone commented that they like to see it, um, I ended up playing for about four or five hours that night. <laughs> and I just got to the point where I could hire someone to flog someone that said uh, spread a nasty rumor about me. And I realized if I had kept playing past that, I would just play until the morning, so I had to cut it off. But um, unfortunately, the flogging failed, and uh, that kind of put a blemish on me on the town council. But uh, I had just been elected to... Um, the council is an informer, so I was doing pretty good for myself. <laughs> I don't imagine how you could stop playing after you get the ability to flog somebody. It's probably a good thing. Probably a good thing it failed. Otherwise, you wouldn't get any sleep that night. After that, it's going to be dueling, and that has not ever ended well for me. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. How about you, Chance? You ever looked into any games like that? No. Uh, Real time strategy really freaks me out. Uh, I don't know why. I'm just. I just can't. For some reason, I just can't process my thoughts as fast as some of those games go. I bought uh, Warhammer uh, Shadow of the Horned Rat a while back and thought that I would really like to play it. You know, because I was kind of interested in in a little bit of like the tabletop Warhammer stuff and like the Warhammer 40k. Um, not that I would actually really get into it because it's kind of expensive. Um, but, you know, just the, the whole Warhammer universe kind of uh, intrigued me, so I bought that game, and I played it for probably two hours and died I don't know how many times. So it was just, I couldn't figure out exactly what I, was, what I was supposed to be doing, and I wasn't having any fun. So I'm, I'm kind of to the point where maybe it's not the type of thing that I really want to play, um, but, you know, I, 
I, I am interested in some others, you know, so I, I might give it a shot later on too, but it's just, I don't know. It's just something that, it's a genre that I don't know that much about. And like you guys, like I don't play that many PC games. Uh, I really don't have that many. And I pretty much just stick with um, console stuff. Just not just not out of thinking that PC is, is less than console gaming. It's just like you guys like said, I don't have a good gaming PC either. And it's just not something that I thought that I should invest in either for some reason. I played a little bit of, like, StarCraft a little bit, too. Um, same deal. Like, I couldn't figure out what I was supposed to be doing. So I just, I don't know, I just didn't hold my attention that well. So I don't, I, yeah, I, that's about it, though. Well, TG, what would you say uh, you'd recommend maybe for a good start and stepping stone for maybe the type of genre to get someone into it? Uh, well, I know the Age of Empires series has uh, done really well over the years. Um, Age of Empires 3 is a bit different from the second one. Uh, but I, I still play part two and three. Um, those are easy, really easy to get into. Um, uh, let's see, Rise of Legends. I think that's come out now as one of those ten dollar bundles you can get it in Rise of Nations. Uh, Rise of Nations is the predecessor, and that was that's really easy to get into. It's got a kind of a risk style over map, and that you invade territories and you get the resources of that territory if you win the real time battle portion of it. And there's a little card mechanic. Uh, so those are really easy to get into. Very simple systems of upgrading. Um, the the core units follow kind of the rock, paper, scissors um, style of mechanics of archers beating infantrymen, spearmen, cavalry, and cavalry archers. Uh, but as you level up, it does a good job of pacing you, so as they introduce new units, you're not overwhelmed. So I would go with, um, and oddly enough, I think those that is Ensemble and Big Huge Games, um, all their titles. So basically any of those, Rise of Nations, Rise of Legends, and the Age of series will... Uh, or the easiest, I'd say, to get into. Now, the Civ ones have all, always interested me. Would those be a little bit step above those, or could those be easy uh, now, to handle as well? I have never, ever, ever been good in the Civilization games. I'm not sure why. You know, I'll read forum threads, and people say how easy it is up until the second the hardest difficulty. Um, I played Part 5 with an old friend from high school, and I had my second town, and I thought I was doing well. And here he comes running from the right side of the screen because he had circled the map pretty much and he was asking me what I was doing and I'm thinking I'm connecting towns you know I've got some transportation income coming in and he had already <laughs> beat the computer for three-fourths of the world and he was like what oh, in the man. hell is wrong with you and so I was like never mind never again we're done I don't want to play this again <laughs> Whoa, that bad huh? yeah I'm, well I own them all I'm just terrible at them so I don't follow them on a tree in? What was that? Go ahead. I was going to say, I don't follow the set tree for some reason. I know you can, there's build orders to maximize uh, real research points and income, but I, <laughs> I play it kind of a, of a stupid way in that I think, well, I think at this point my people should have the alphabet, have the alphabet, you know, and then I give it some time, and now you need math. Even though they don't connect in any way and it doesn't benefit them in the long term, I, I just play it like I think the people at this point need pottery, have pottery. And they're on the ground going, uh, you know, it'd be nice if we could farm. I'm like, yeah, worry about that later. You make some pots now. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's funny because you were talking about um, not understanding, like, the build order and stuff. Uh, I think we talked about this a few episodes back with, like, the, the professional gaming and how I would set and watch StarCraft II, uh, these Koreans, just go nuts with this game and just set their mesmerized. I have no fucking clue what's going on or even how to play StarCraft, but... I'm just sitting there like, oh man, shit's getting real now, you know, because the, the <laughs> announcers are like, you know, telling you, uh, oh, you know, there's a, I don't even know the name of the units and stuff, and it's just, it's funny because it, it's such an intricate game, and there, there's, you, supposedly there's a way that you can play it any way you want, but really there's a set, like, you need to have this, you need to have this, you need to have this, and then you can have this, and I, I can never wrap my brain around that, you know. That's why I never play those online. I, I almost never, ever follow build orders because I play every game pretty much like Civilization where it's, you know, I think I want a barracks right now. I'll make a barracks, and, you know, by that point, if it's two and a half minutes into the match, you should have the armory first with an upgrade and the barracks with, you know, a unit upgrade. And so every time I play it online, I pretty much lost, so I just gave up on that. Yeah. Hey, we're hungry. Give us some food. Nah, make more pots. Yeah. <laughs> I bestow hey, upon I'm you I'm going to keep that. I'm going to keep that line. Not now. Make pots. <laughs> yeah. I shall give you pottery. Say that, 
I'm going to say that to my nieces when they want me to do something. No, even Not better. Now. Go make pops. E- even better. Say it to your coworkers and just look at their face. <laughs> Not now. Go get, Go make some pots. I give you pottery. Make pots. <laughs> I like to be benevolent to my, my virtual people. Yeah. I'm sure that'll go really well in my office. So Let's like move on. Hey, Ash, what you're playing, Skid. I think we do an episode on. But yes, we can move on. Favorite recording artist. Uh, I was actually telling uh, uh, Doomways this. I don't really listen to music, so I own maybe 10 CDs. I, I don't really have a, f- a favorite. Um, I, the only band I listen to, if someone put the CD on, I don't really mind, is pretty much Guns N' Roses, but anything else, you know, I don't really pay attention to it, um, w- which is kind of a, 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 I'm the anomaly because my wife's really into music, my brother's really into music, my parents are, that I just kind of turn the volume down whenever something comes on. <laughs> I will accept so, Guns N' Roses. That so is a good it, answer in my book. It's just November <laughs> rain and constant rotation. <laughs> well, when I was, when I was younger, rain. friends would get really annoyed because I'd immediately mute the television, and all you'd hear is the clicking of the controllers, and they would just look at me like, what is wrong with you? Turn the, te- the volume up. And I'm going, no, no, no. What's the point of that? So even, like, so even like the video game music you're not into? Um, there's some. I like the, the soundtrack to Nier. I like some of the songs. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Persona, uh, Persona 4 Golden. Um, I own the... I'm not sure if you've ever played the Myth series. It was before Bungie made Halo. They made a strategy series. I have the soundtrack of that, but that's all orchestral. But, uh, yeah, for most games, I actually don't don't listen to anything. Unless, you know, it's a, I'm playing a line and it's a shooter and I have to hear if someone's coming or something like that. Yeah. I can remember my parents playing Tetris and Dr. Mario a lot. And they would always turn the music off, too. And it always drove me nuts. It's like, why did you turn the music? <laughs> well, that to listen that, to Tetris music. That Tetris music will drill its hole, drill a hole into your brain, yeah, man. It could get old like, after. I mean, I haven't, I haven't played Tetris in like 15 years, but I bet you I can still do the Tetris music. <laughs> you know? I'm hearing it in my head right now. Do 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 do. You know, it, it's just it's. <laughs> I mean, you cannot get that out of your brain. Did you play Tetris on the Game Boy or the NES? Like Game the Boy. Most? Game Boy. Yeah, see, mine was mine was uh, Nintendo. I actually don't even. I've never owned it for the for the Game Boy. Believe it or not, and so the, the NES music was a little bit better. I thought like it, it was. I don't know. More orchestral. More. <laughs> yeah, it was just a little bit more eight bit awesome. I guess. Uh, anyway, moving on. Well, do we have a favorite film then? Do you watch TV? Uh, I don't really watch a lot of TV. Uh, I do watch movies though, and oh. a favorite one. Not I have a probably a handful that I'll, I'll stick to. Like I really enjoy Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. If you ever seen that one, um, Primer, the time travel show. Um, what else? Um, I, I'd say those two: Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross for dialogue, Primer for the themes, and um, the favorite though. I enjoy the Samurai trilogy. If you've seen those. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, and so uh, yeah, the seventh uh, was it? I always get it. Always when I go to say it, I say seventh sign, but I mean seventh seal. Yeah. Um, Demi Moore movie always gets me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so not not a set favorite, but uh, I go back to those two a lot or three. I've never seen any of those. Oh, uh, you, yeah. You see, now here's the thing, though. You've probably seen something. Um, the seventh seal has become so influential in film. Like, have you seen? Um, Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey? No. Oh, okay, well, never mind. What? Well, anyway... I never, I never, I never saw the first one, either. Okay, have you ever seen... Okay, have you ever seen anybody in a film play Death, a game of chess, to stay alive? Have you ever seen uh, that? Because it's been in, like, a ton of stuff. It's been, like, The Simpsons. It's been in a ton of stuff. Nope. Okay. Well, never mind. Uh, well, uh, you, I'm, I'm the uncultured one here. I'm very sorry. <laughs> You, you have like 800 VHS tapes. There's got to be one in there. Yeah, you got to have the Seven Seal on VHS somewhere in that game. <laughs> chance. No, 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 I don't. Sorry. Well, I have seen the, in the pickup videos behind me. There's a poster on the wall. That's uh, my wife got that for me as a gift. It's the Dance of Death. It's at the end of the film. She had that printed out in frame for me. So that's from the movie. It's a silhouette of people on the on top of a mountain. So. You'll get a glimpse of that in the background from that. You know, now that you know what it is, that's up from the seventh seal. I'll have to go out <laughs> to watch your video again just to <laughs> get a glimpse of the poster of the movie that I haven't seen. 
there, yeah. Well, it's it's a still. It's not even uh, from the a set poster, so you'll actually get a, a a touch of the movie there. It's a about a knight right. coming back from the Crusades in Sweden that has to play death in a game of chess to stay alive. Uh, a little anachronistic because the plague wasn't in Sweden at the time, but when he comes back, you know, plagues ravage the land, and he's got to travel, and he meets people along the way, and each person kind of represents a theme of humanity. Uh, probably not making it sound very interesting, but it's worth seeing. Is it on Netflix? Yeah, uh, no. Uh, well, yeah, it is. I think it is actually. Um, it well, if it is, is I'll, yeah. I'll check it out because I have Netflix and I, I will. I will watch that for you. I will talk to you myself. I could just see like <laughs> I, I could just see Apollaeus watching the Seventh Seal, being like, "Wait a minute, the plague wasn't in Sweden. I'm done with this shit." <laughs> <laughs> Flip a table, walk out the room, finish. <laughs> done. Do not do not over underestimate the the impact of a table flipping. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, now, well, how is your wife? You said, you said you're you're married. So, how's your wife feel about your YouTube and your gaming and stuff? Is she a gamer herself, or is she into it? Uh, Professor Layton, Mario, and Zelda, and that's and Kirby, and basically Nintendo properties. If that's that, she's good. But uh, she's primarily a reader. Nothing wrong with that. Sounds what like you a think good about you having a YouTube channel. Uh, not nothing much really. <laughs> <laughs> just something I one of the many things I do in the back of the house. <laughs> I told my wife today I was like I'm recording a podcast today. By the way, she's like, has it been a month already? She's like, she feels like I just do this stuff every day. I'm like, no, it, it's been about three four weeks, and I'm going in there to do it. Well, fine. Has it but, been a month already? <laughs> <that's> funny. <laughs> it actually has been a little bit. I was just thinking about that the other day when you guys were talking about. Uh, doing another thing. <laughs> I was like, oh, man, we, we should okay. When you guys were talking about recording the mini show, I was like, man, we haven't actually recorded like a regular episode in quite a while. Well, when so. I when I brought those ideas of a mini show up to Stephen, I thought we were going to do them a lot more frequent than what we have been. <laughs> well, I think it's a great idea, but you know, just getting all three of us, you know, on the same page, or at least two of us. Yeah. You know, where we we could do do a mini so talking about, you know, one topic. And, you know, the topic that you guys had was a very good topic. It just didn't work out because Steven's a bit under the weather. So. Yes, yeah, like I called the plague. Then I couldn't do anything. <laughs> Steven, the plague wasn't in Virginia. <laughs> it was this week. You're gonna, it was you're going to make PG League. <laughs> He's going to flip a table <laughs> in his house. <laughs> you, you just hear this big crash and, fuck this, I'm done. <laughs> and then we just move on. But, but no, yeah, we. I, I hope we get some more mini, some mini episodes in. And like we said, even anyone, it doesn't even have to be us. We can bring in anybody just to fill in an episode. So if you want to talk you about Doom to with that. someone, chance you can go ahead and bring in anyone you want to talk about Doom. What happened to that Pop Dead Space one we're gonna do? I still haven't finished it because oh. <laughs> the buddy I'm playing with won't meet up with me to finish the game. I get. <laughs> Well, that's fine. But, but, yeah, you guys should definitely do a uh, mini show coming up about the other game because it sounds like a shot. game. You can see it, yes. Okay, I, I don't know how much you wanted to keep under wraps here. I'm just trying to <laughs> yeah. respect the, the, the podcast here. Uh, but, yeah, it sounds like a pretty awesome game. I watched both of your videos, and it's just, yeah, it's it sounds like a game. It's just absolutely nuts awesome. So I can't believe I, you haven't played them, Chance. I, I can't either. I think what it is is that when it first came out, and at least like the first two, I hadn't heard much about it, and I guess I just didn't know that it was a first-person shooter, too. So, like, the story didn't, you know, I hadn't heard much about it. I just saw this, you know, the, the Big Daddy thing, and I'm like, oh, what the hell is this? You know, and I just I just never looked into it. And, see, uh <clears throat> when I see that, that big, if I would have saw that Big Daddy on a case, I'd been like, oh, what the fuck is this? I need to check this out. <laughs> see, and at the same time, it came out, like, when I wasn't, personally playing that many games playing and oh. buying many games so it's just something i've i've looked over completely and now i see this this all this stuff about infinite and it just looks so amazing and it sounds so awesome that i just i need to play it and i might play it before i play the other two quite honestly you can but, uh, yeah it's yeah, i mean it's, it's connected but it's not connected very yeah i mean who knows? I mean, I'm so slow at playing games anyway, so... Well, there... Geez. I mean, trust me. You put in Bioshock 1 and that first 10, 15 minutes of the game, you're going to play for, like, 
three hour, three four hours that first night. Oh, it's really long. Like I know that infinite's not crazy long, but it's the they're all about really they're long? all about ten twelve hours. See, that's okay because like for me, it's like with a first person shooter, especially, it's like I don't want it to be like you know thirty hours long. It's like I don't know if I could play a first person shooter. It just depends uh, on how. It depends on how much you get wrapped up in the world and how much yes. you want to explore it. I guess so. And this yeah. would be, you know, one of the first first person shooters I've played will have played that has, you know, a very, uh, you know, very, very, very solid story. Because most of the other ones I've played, you know, are, are you know, the id games and and like Call of Duty and stuff like that. You know, that that doesn't <clears throat> really have good of a story to begin with. That's not what it's about. But let, let me I'm, ask. I'm pretty excited to check it out. Uh, TG, you've played the Bioshocks, right? Uh, the first two, yep. Okay. So, Chance, if I ask, if I say, would you kindly, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Like, do you know what that, do you know? Like, in reference to Bioshock? Yeah. No. Okay, you're fine. Play the games. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, <Dude. laughs> I'm so confused. <laughs> just play, just go, go, go somewhere, go find Bioshock 1 and throw it in and play it, and don't talk to me until yeah. you get done. Okay. Well, they're pretty cheap, too, so I think yeah. next time I go to GameStop, I'm going to look and see if they, they have them both. I'm planning on going, like, next week to pick up Pandora's Tower, so yeah, yeah. when I get that, I'll probably try to pick up both the, the first two Bioshocks. Yeah, because they're all... Maybe by the time I'm finished with those two, then the, the maybe there'll be a price drop in the third one, because I'm kind of a cheap state Actually, right now. Actually, don't Trying you... Trying to buy a 3DS... Don't you get Bioshock 1 with the PS3 version of Bioshock Infinite? I don't think so. I know they have the bundle out now. There's a little cool yeah. little collector's pack with 1 and 2 I would recommend getting. I thought I saw bonus stuff. I thought I saw on a case somewhere. Maybe it was like a, just an exclusive at one of the stores, but I thought it said something Maybe about it. Hmm? The Spratic Space Bar had uh, the PlayStation 3 version. It, it has the original, but he bought the, the big collector's version, so I'm not sure if it comes with yeah, he uh, the one with the standard the big bird thing. Uh, right, yeah. I think it does, because I saw... I mean, this was just a normal case, and I think it was at Meyer. It was just in the, the bin there, you know? I was like, you get, you get the first game with Infinite? That's a deal yeah. and a half. That's a, that's a fucking deal. Yeah. Like, like for, for... Is it more expensive, though? Like, is it, like, um, 60 Bioshock, bucks instead of 60 bucks? Or what? Bioshock 1 was not released on PS3 until oh. the, the dual uh, the dual release, oh, Bioshock yeah. 2, right? I'm correct in that. Like it, it was a. I Xbox. thought I saw it. I thought I've seen it before. Like I swear I've seen one and two for the PS3 oh, at yeah. GameStop. Well, because my copy, I got Bioshock when it first. I mean, right, right, launch day, and it says only on Xbox 360 and Windows. So mm-hmm. yeah, they I, they did re-release it later for PS3. Though I'm I kind of torn. The dual pack came out. Yeah, I'm kind of torn. What system I want to buy it for too? Because I. I love my Xbox 360, but I'm having so much fun playing my PlayStation 3 too. Like I'm, like really, really glad that I bought it finally because I really like it. So I don't uh, think I'm there's any. Tw- I don't think there's any issues because sometimes the PS3 ports will have issues that the 360. Right. I, don't, I don't know. Who knows? Actually, Maybe I'll just. They, they said it was a pretty good port for the PS3, so uh, I think it'd be like a controller preference. 360 yeah. is a tad better for shooters, so it's all a preference, yeah, I guess. I guess. I haven't played any first-person shooters on the PS3 yet. I have Battlefield Bad Company too, but I haven't played it yet. So, who knows? I'll probably get it on 360 because I love the 360 controller. Well, should we go. use that? Should we use that as a lead-in to our topic? Sure. As, as Chance uh, expresses his love for the 360. <laughs> I well, I wanted to say. You said Chance could play for four hours. I got a, I got a cool story real quick about the first Bioshock. You're either going to play for four hours, or you could be like my uh, roommate at the time, one of my best friends, and drop the controller within the first minute of the game. <laughs> and if Dustin or TG remembers, I downloaded the demo before we bought the game, the very first Bioshock. And at the time, I, I was a little hesitant about playing it. It looked a little scary. I was like, and I'm into survival horror, but I was like, this, this is kind of different. That's what really got me into Rapture and Bioshock. But I downloaded the demo, and I wanted to use him as the guinea pig. So I was like, here, man, you play the demo. I didn't want to let him know, like, hey, I, I'm a little skeptical about playing it because I didn't want to get scared of it. <laughs> and, uh, and this comes from the guy who doesn't get scared in games, but this one had me kind of freaked out <laughs> just from looking at the cover and what I heard about it. So he picks up the controller, plane crash, you're going through the ocean, into the lighthouse, 
and then he walks in, and I forget what you see right when you go in. I don't know if there's a dead body or not hanging the, from the walls. It's the statue of Andrew Ryan. Yeah, there's a statue there, but uh, I think the lights go out. And yeah. he turned around to go out the door, and the door slammed in his face. He said, F this. He threw the controller down, and he walked away. And that's when I had to pick up <laughs> to start playing. Because as soon as that door shut and the lights went out, it was done for him. So... If you can make it past that part, you'll be okay. Well, I don't well, know. Didn't Paige, so when didn't get, Paige say that she didn't get into it, too? Like, she played for a while and then gave up? Yeah, I, I believe so. Yeah. yeah. See, that's that game's a whole lot creepier than uh, Infinite. You're going to run into creepy yeah. stuff in Bioshock, which is what I, I love about it. So. That's, that's something I thought, too. I was like, I was, you know, playing through Infinite and the storyline and everything, and I was like, this is nowhere near as disturbing. I mean, it's disturbing on one level which is, like, all the racism and things like that, but it's nowhere near as disturbing as Bioshock was. Nowhere near like, as disturbing. Like, when you start getting into, like, what happens to Rapture, you're like, holy shit. It's like, these people are just sitting around eating each other, you know? Ugh. Anyway. <laughs> That'll be an well, I'm kind of excited to play <laughs> I'm kind of excited to play the whole series, so, you know, kudos, gentlemen, for convincing me to buy more games. Well, that's, that's what YouTube's <laughs> for. Actually, that's, that's right. Ask, I was going to ask you uh, this, TG. Um, has have you found that your game buying has increased with your uh, being on YouTube? Um, yeah, a bit. It has. I uh, I blame that in conjunction with Steam sales that they have like three times a year now, and so I know uh, just from browsing YouTube. And then those set was it the New Year's, Christmas, and they have summer sales that I'm just going to destroy my PayPal account and stack up uh, in the games library. I thought they had a spring one, and I was disappointed because I, I haven't seen anything unless I missed it. Well, uh, Amazon got real aggressive, too, with sales, so uh, last holiday season, yeah, I just – and Green Man Gaming, I'm not sure if you've ever used them, but they uh, they actually allow you to uh, trade in your digital content for uh, – and some t sometimes you get credit, other times cash, or like a few games offer the option of both. Um, they undercut both uh, Amazon and Steam by a good bit sometimes. So uh, that in that regard, yeah, a lot of times uh, I kind of have an idea for the console stuff, what I want, and I'll just look up gameplay footage, and if it looks like something I'm going to go with, then I'll pick it up then. Uh, I don't discover too many console things uh, through YouTube. Every now and then, I don't, I don't have a huge like Super Nintendo collection, so if I see s something like that, um, I'll go that route. But for 32-bit and uh, around that era, I'm, I'm pretty good with what I'm looking for. Now, wait, I want to... I want to ask you something. You said this site allows you to trade in your digital content. How does that work? Yeah. Um, I've never actually done it. Well, I actually I have done it because what they'll do is um, they'll give away some games. And uh, like they, had, they gave away Disciples 2 for $5. And in the email it said, claim your free copy and then wait a week and turn it back in for $5. So I uh, claimed it, waited a week, and they had a sale for Infinite Undiscovery for I think $7.99. And they said, you have three games in your library that you can trade in. And so I clicked Disciples 2, and it took the $5 off, and I only had to pay the two ninety nine dollars for Infinite Discovery. And so um, I'm, they, use, they have a capsule program that some games use, but very few. Most of the time, you just get a, um, a Steam code, but I'm guessing it's only with their capsule games that uh, you play by loading it up, and it's just kind of a, a small program that runs in the background. Um, if, you, if it uses that, then they can lock you out if you trade it in. But otherwise, or most of the time, you just get Steam codes. I got a Steam code for XCOM, Enemy Unknown, um, Sonic Generations. Those are the last few you bought off of them. Uh, but yeah, there are a few that they give away free or you buy through them that uses their capsule, and you trade those in. And now they've, tr they've switched to um, cash in some instances where I think it's like a 10 or 15% reduction, but they'll PayPal you money back if you don't want the, the store credit. It's awesome. That is incredibly strange. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they seem to have got, gotten have figured that out. When I, I see a lot of videos of people are wondering what can be done with digital content if you can't trade it or sell it back in, but they seem to they've been doing this for a while now. Where you can, uh, you know, if it, I guess if it's in a closed system like a Steam or something, then it's yeah. perfectly possible for them to shut you off from the game. Uh, you know, good old games let you download uh, the game, the executable itself. Um, it has its own install wrapper, but. Uh, it could, you know, they couldn't do it, but for something like a Steam or Green Man Gaming capsule, yeah, they can just cut you off from installing it because you traded it back in and remove it from your library. So okay. it, that that's definitely possible. Not that I, you know, that's not going to be a, a selling point for me in the future. It's just nice that they do it because, like I said, they'll just give away games with the express purpose of you trading it in to buy something better. Yeah. 
That's nuts. That's cool. Back in the day, we called those coupons. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, of course, you can play the game until you trade it in two, so that was nice. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Hmm. But yeah, now we can go into uh, the old Xbox uh, topic if we'd like. Not the old Xbox, the new Xbox. The new. And I had the actual quotes of the guy up until yeah, I but, looked up to see if Bioshock you know, was on. I looked into that more, and that guy is just like, he's not even like somebody in charge. He's just like some kind of creative guy that's just like, I don't know. But I mean, I guess... Well, when you hit, big pants. Hmm? He's wearing some big pants with some high pockets. Yeah. That's about it. Well, when I heard Microsoft Studios' creative director, it sounded important to me. <laughs> I figured what he carried might have a little bit of weight with it, but it might well, not. might not, because I'm pretty it sure. Doesn't, according to Major Nelson. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that dude's fired right now, or at least in the process <laughs> of getting fired. But So anyway, if anyone hasn't heard, uh, the Microsoft creative director, uh, Adam Orth, he had tweeted on his account... People are complaining because they're hearing all these rumors about the new Xbox coming out is going to be always online. And his remark to that was, deal with it. Just deal with it. Gentlemen, how how are you going to deal with this if that's how it is? He wants to start off. TG, I'd like to hear him start off because he likes playing PC games. So would, would something like an always-on Xbox uh, deter you from wanting to get it at all or... Would you be kind of ticked off about it? Oh yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't buy one. Um, the main argument I hear about that is Steam. Well, for Steam, I'd primarily leave it in offline mode, so I don't. Ha- I've never had problems with offline mode. I know some people do, but that way I don't even have to yeah. worry about it. If I hear of an update, I'll go online and grab the update. But ninety-five percent of the time, I leave it offline, and I haven't had any problems. Um, now I'm not sure how accurate the information that's been released is, but I read that they'll have like a a grace period of something like three minutes before it kicks you out. Um, my connection goes down all the time, and so uh, yeah, that would not be something. I would, you know, that's to me, it's a deal breaker. I would just wouldn't get the system because that's something an, a whole extra thing I'd have to worry about. And I just want to pop a disc in and play it, or you know, if it's Steam, download it, go offline, and I don't have to worry about it again. So yeah, that's something yeah. that um, even though I've become acclimated to it through PC gaming, gaming most of those have you know alternate routes, so you don't have to. Even Ubisoft has took, taken out some of their always-on DRM because people don't like it so much. So it'd be really strange if Microsoft decided to go whole hog with that. Chance, go yeah, I, 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 I absolutely love the Xbox, and for the most part, I haven't been too upset thus far with things that Microsoft have done or you know contributed to the to the gaming community or not contributed. I've been pretty satisfied. I really loved the first, the original Xbox, and I really loved the 360. And I gotta say, I am really pissed off, and probably won't buy the new one at least at first. I can't sit here and say that I absolutely won't buy it because I am a big fan of the Halo series, and I'm I'm starting to like you know other other exclusive Xbox series and things like that. So I can't sit here and say that I will not buy this system eventually, because I probably will, on, in, quite, in all honesty. But I guarantee you I won't be buying it right away. And uh, I, just, I, I just, even if this was going to be the way that it goes, you know, even if this is the way that it is going to be, for the guy to say, deal with it, it really shows, you know, just how arrogant and just whatever that Microsoft has become in the gaming community, and it's just, it, it bugs me a little bit. Um, it's, it's, you know, fairly well known that the, the Xbox 360 did, you know, tons better than the PS3 in the States, at least at first. Um, but I, I really don't think that that's going to be the case um, coming up. I just, the, granted, there's going to be a, a lot of, you know, mindless people, you know, that want to play Madden and and call of duty that that buy the system just because that's the, the newest one and it's the one that's got the newest games on it that's what they're going to do you know there's going to be a lot of those type of people so it will still sell like crazy but i just have a feeling that as far as from a, an actual gamer's perspective that it's just not going to do as well and i really hope that uh, nintendo and sony really just kind of pick up the pieces and can just 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 put out some awesome games that's really what i hope before we let uh, Dustin get in, he also had a couple more uh, remarks about on his Twitter because people started lighting up his Twitter feed like crazy. So 
So he then would put, sometimes the electricity goes out, I will not purchase a vacuum cleaner. The mobile reception in my area I live in is spotty and unreliable. I will not buy a mobile phone. Then he says, sorry for expressing my personal opinion about what I want for electronic devices that I pay for on Twitter, Jesus. And then I think someone asked him, what about people who can't get internet? His response was, those people should get with the times and get internet. It's awesome. And I want every device to be always on. It, uh, Dustin, what's this guy doing, man? Uh, well, this guy is an arrogant asshole. But hey, I was going to say to you, I bet you that I bet you that um, the mobile phone comment really chapped your ass, didn't it? Oh my goodness! I was like, <laughs> I can't even get internet in my neighborhood and, or where I live. And luckily, with the mobile phone, I am able to. But uh, I, I don't know. Yeah. Go ahead. How how's this guy just? What do you think about it? The Xbox is going to be like this. Well, we, we saw, look, we saw the same thing happen to PlayStation with the PS3. Sony was on top with the PS2. They made this uh, wildly, um, it, it, it's just a very difficult system to create for the PS3. Um, you know, and they're very arrogant about it. They're like, oh, it, it, whatever, it's, it is what it is, you know. And, you know, pride before the fall. And PlayStation 3 did not do well. And really, you know, Xbox is on top right now. And they're doing the same exact thing. So guess what the next this next system is going to do? <laughs> Nothing. If there was ever a time for Nintendo to come in and sucker punch both of these companies, this is the time. Because Sony is reeling, absolutely reeling from the PS3 and the Vita. Um, which, we can talk about the Vita later, because Sony's a bunch of fucking morons. That is a, <laughs> There is no reason why that Vita should not be outselling the 3DS. Like, I just got that thing the other day, and I am amazed by it. It's an amazing piece of technology. But, if there was ever a time for Nintendo to come from the rear and just knock these guys out, you know, this is the time to do it, because Sony is just walking, or not Sony, um, Microsoft is just walking into a firing squad smiling. And Sony is, like, limping into the finish line. This is the time for Nintendo to really knock it home. But I don't know if they can do that with the Wii U or not. But, yeah, I, I like, right now, if the, if these rumors are true with this always online, with it blocking used games, which I think that's been debunked, or at least really pushed back into the rumor the rumor bin, um, I really have no interest in the, the next Xbox. Because there's, I mean, there's not a lot of exclusives now anymore. Um, really the only exclusive that I would care about looking at my shelf is Halo. And I'm pretty yeah. sure I can live the rest of my life not playing another Halo game, you know? Um, you need to know what happened to Cortana. What are you talking oh, about? I can watch a, Let's, I can watch a Let's Play online. Um, yeah, you can. <laughs> but, uh, what was it? Damn it, Steven. It, it lost my train. <laughs> you said there yeah, weren't many exclusives. There's not many exclusives so. for the, the, the 360. And to be honest with you, I've never really been um, a big Xbox fanboy. Um, I think it's just always felt that Microsoft was just kind of like, you know, well, we're going to do this now because it seems like we can make some money there. Whereas, you know, in the, I kind of felt that same way about Sony back in the PlayStation 1 days, whereas Nintendo's always been there, and it feels like Nintendo's the bastion for pure gaming for some reason. That's just my opinion. But, um, yeah, like... And it doesn't seem like the new Xbox is really going to be a game console anyway. It's going to be like an entertainment hub. And I'm like... Multi media. Yeah, and I'm like, yeah, it sounds like a 3DO. You know? It's, it's an interactive, you know, disc player. It's not really a we game... We all know how that went. We all know how that went, you know? So I, I it seems like it's more for streaming, um, you know, Netflix and things like that than it is for actually playing games. So I don't know. I don't know. Which, uh, which for me, I mean... That would I know if, even if it did stream Netflix and all this other stuff, that is convenient to have all that in one thing. Like right now, if I uh, since my phone's been bumped up to 4G and all that good stuff, I'll watch Netflix or something or a movie, but I'll watch it through my laptop connected to the TV. I'm not using the 360. So if there is something that makes that easier for me, I mean, but PS4 is going to have all that stuff and everything too. Yeah. And it, I think it's coming to the Wii U as well, right? They're starting to get all these licenses yeah. for TV and all that. But I think what I think if something can cause this much stir in the atmosphere in the gaming community, and then you get a response from someone like Major Nelson, there was an update where he said he's apologizing for the inappropriate comments about the employee. The person's not a spokesman for Microsoft, and his personal views do not reflect the customer-centric approach we take on our products. Blah, blah, blah. They said there have been no 
definite announcement. So I think when at least people are hearing that, hey, they saw how we reacted to this, and they're probably going to say, you know what, this probably is a dumb idea. I mean, we're seeing all of this trouble this is causing, but do we think the damage might have been done already? Like, there's so much negative. Can they get it back? If they, even if they say, we're not going to always be online, you think they've already lost people to the PS4 and Wii U? I think, I mean, personally, me, I, I'm going to get a Wii U um, probably here in the fall, and I'm really looking forward to that. And looking, I mean, of course, th- the 720 is just rumor and speculation right now. But it does seem like Sony is learning their lesson and really trying to make the next system what the PlayStation 3 should have been. So I, I'm, right now, I'm kind of giving Sony more of the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. Well, what I wonder about is I have a bandwidth cap. And so for the PlayStation 4, I would quickly reach that streaming you know, just a yeah. few PlayStation 2 games. So the, neither of those are very uh, good options for me if, if Microsoft does go with Always On and Sony is going to go with, uh, as I said, tr- streaming for pretty much everything. Well, at that point, I'd rather just keep my PlayStation 3 that has, you know, downloadable versions of everything I have off PSN um, and swap files between that and the Vita instead of having to worry about hitting my bandwidth for the month and either paying, you know, outrageous rates because I go over the cap or just not turning the system on until the next month. Yeah, I guess I didn't think about that with the PS4s. I mean, unless there's a way you can turn all that shit off, which I, God, I, I hope so, you know? I hope yeah, it's... Yeah, I think they said they, they will have discs. They said they'll have yeah. discs, so I don't know how much streaming actually means or what, what all they'll mean. They didn't get too much into it at that wonderful conference they had, but... <laughs> well, I... I for uh, I have a lot on PSN for the Vita and the PSP, and uh, I think they said the PlayStation 3 as well will all be streaming. And while the 4 will have the disc, but everything else will have to be coming from their the cloud service. And so for me, like I said, I, I split that with Netflix already and Hulu, and that'll just that'll eat up the bandwidth in no time. So for me, I have the Wii U now. I'll most likely just stick with that, keep the PlayStation 3 and the 360, and you know, unless something gets worked out down the line, um, it wouldn't be worth it because of my connection and the restrictions to really go, you know, much past this current generation. So maybe I missed that. Did they say that, like, because it does have a hard drive in it. Are you not going to be able to save stuff to the hard drive anymore? They have, it was a weird service where they want you to do is you can download chunks of it and play as it downloads. That was one. But then they also said that um, it won't natively support PlayStation 3, but they want to work toward their entire library is streamable from, is it G- Gekai, something like that? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I think yeah, David, Gekai, David Perry yeah. talked about it. Yeah, all that will be streaming from their service. But they also made mention of downloads, so uh, maybe the downloads are for the current generation, and but all the previous stuff, yeah, they, they want that to be streaming and have these services to where, you know, you can instantly start streaming, play the game, um, and as you play, you can unlock it, and you just, it charges your account, and you don't have to back out of the game, you can just keep playing. But all that, like I said, is from their cloud service, which is just going to constantly run up my bandwidth. Yeah, I hate streaming. I even like even with the internet, like the videos, like YouTube and stuff like that's getting better. But I just I hate it. I hate it so much when I hit that oh, yeah. fucking buffering wall and it just sets there. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, just play, you stupid! I wish I could just download like people's YouTube videos and watch them, you know, in a chunk and then delete them. You know what I mean? Like I just I hate streaming. I'm an old man. I hate streaming. I don't want Dustin's. Whole, I'm, I'm an old man rants. <laughs> and I don't really know how. Uh, I'm trying to think of a way where to try to play the devil's advocate. Like, I'll say, well, this is a good idea for Microsoft, but I just looked up the Diablo 3 sales, which you always have to be online for. 3 million. And I mean, if that's going to be your console number, you want to sell three to ten million consoles, and I'm sorry, you're you're out of the race. Then, well, I mean, that's, that's going to be the customers you want. I don't know. You forgot a very important important factor there, Stephen. That's three million sold, but it's also three million people complaining about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, they also and dropped the whole, that to the uh, the console version. They did it with the console version too. No, they dropped. They dropped that. Oh, they, they dropped. You don't need to be on for the the console version. Yeah. Well, thank God. They did it with Sim City too, and I guess that really messed that game up. <laughs> Yeah, that hasn't been doing well. Yeah. Oh, that's a the huge debacle there. Yes, with uh, well, having I, EA's president having to step down because of all that stuff. But well, you know, it's well, about like, that. I, I'm sorry. I, someone someone was uh, talking. Yeah, I was just gonna say, wasn't it like a deal where the game wasn't wasn't even really supposed to be released yet? Like it wasn't done. They weren't done making it. 
they're like, ah, oh, we'll just put it out there and see how it works. And then they put it out there, and then it screws up, and they take it offline, and people have already paid for it and can't play it or something like that. Well, that's the way it is with every game nowadays. It's just like, ah, oh, we'll just patch it later. No, no worries. Yeah, it's a bunch of bull. But it's about time that, you know, because I remember, um, was it Nintendo that was facing a bunch of losses and, like, all the big wigs took a 50% pay cut because they're like, yeah. oh, the company's, you know, failing under our leadership. It's our fault. Instead of cutting, like, actual, like, you know, lower jobs, they're like, oh, no, it's our fault because we're leading the company. You know, it's about time American companies start working like that. So with the guy at EA stepping down, well, yeah, he probably should. <laughs> I was saying it's not. It, I wish more companies had the mindset of like I read your article about X Seed. You know they're probably not raking in the dough over there, they're but struggling I mean they're here for the they're here for the fans, and they're like we know what the fans want, so we're going to do our best to try to get it to them, the players. But it seems like Microsoft they're just caring about the dough. They don't care about the players. It's just greed and money, and well, I just more Gage people had the heart of employees like X Seed. <laughs> Did you read that article about uh, the new Square Enix um, CEO or president or whatever? Talking about how yeah, I heard about him. To, yeah, they're going to have to like really look and see what works and what doesn't, and what doesn't work is getting slashed. So guess what? Nothing but Final Fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, I'm finding kind of hard to be like unexcited about that. Yeah. Well, that that means like well, no near under that new yeah. leadership near would get cut because it didn't it didn't sell well. Nope. Well, they didn't count. Uh, digital sales for Tomb Raider, which was kind of strange, because I know it's, it seems to have been doing pretty well on Steam. Yeah. And they just and that sold like three and a half million copies, and they said that wasn't good enough. That's, that's pretty good. I wonder if, because Tomb Raider really, um, it really interests me, because it, you, know, you have all these publications saying what a great game it is. All these people on YouTube saying what a great game it is. Do you think, like going back to one of our earlier topics, do you think it's um, because it has a female protagonist? Do you think a bunch of guys are like looking at that game like I don't want to play as some new chick? Give me Gears of War. I know. Coming from the, the series is pretty established. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's established, but at the same time, it, it really hasn't been like. I mean, I remember back in the PlayStation One days where it was like, "Oh, Tomb Raider Two, Oh, Tomb Raider 3. and then it just kind of, you know. Yeah, I think that there's a middle s- sequence of games there that kind of burn some bridges. But I mean, my my parents know about Tomb Raider because of the Angelina Jolie movies. It still it still holds some weight, but yeah, I think the previous Tomb Raiders from this one were actually getting better, but that two or three block in what the early 2000s, I think Angel of Darkness was one that got panned really bad. I think people kind of gave up at that point, um, and it, coming back around. But three and a half, if that was the final figure for the console versions, is that's pretty high for something that I don't think the last one's been out in like five or six years. So, you know, that that was a pretty strong showing, and to not include the digital stuff is. I mean that's that includes Steam, you know, Amazon, uh, Green Man Gaming, all, all the all the uh, supplementals. There's a bunch of European only download markets are not counting, so uh, it probably sold well over that. But um, I remember when the first one came out, they had a cardboard cutout in Blockbuster, and I was running a game, and a, a guy kept poking the butt of a, of the cutout, going, looking at his friend, going, "Check out what I'm doing." I was so embarrassed to be in the game section at that point. I just I just grabbed my copy of. Virtua Fighter 2 and slunked away like, oh, <laughs> uh, That's awesome. Look at, hey, awesome. hey, look at what I'm doing. Look at what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm her butt. Especially back then, the, poly- the models were so rough. She was made of like 100 polygons or something. Yeah. Um, the Tomb Raider I, I, franchise never really appealed to me until, uh, I mean, even the ones I played, I just could not get into Tomb Raider. Yeah. But... I, I mean, the new one here looks great. Yeah, I opinion. really want that new one. Like, it just looks amazing. I, I think Uncharted stole a lot of that steam, too. Um, I'm playing the new one now on PC, and um, it has a lot more quick time, a lot of quick time events. So it's, it's, it is different from Uncharted, but I think if people see third-person cover-based shooter adventuring in, you know, jungles, fighting, yeah. you know, crazy guys with uh, homemade pistols and stuff, there's automatically an assumption that it's Uncharted. Well, I've just had three Uncharted's. Uh, in the last few years, why go back to Tomb Raider? But yeah, they actually integrated a lot of quick time events that aren't terrible, which is pretty surprising since most of them are nowadays. And uh, real nice production values, good voiceover work. I think it's just kind of burned out of the series, and people transitioned over and got their fill with Uncharted. And so now, like I said, Tomb Raider did have a strong showing. It's it's had a, a bit of an uphill, I'd say, uh, battle since release. I read somewhere that a, a third of uh, Fire Emblem Awakening sales were digital. 
And that, well, that's because um, no one could find it, huh? That, yeah. <laughs> but that, that, that blew my mind that, you know, people, uh, you know, that it's it's become that uh, that prevalent. But I guess, yeah, because they couldn't find I mean, I, there's a copy sitting in my GameStop right now. So, I mean, it's all where you're at, really. I'm, I'm sure Steven can probably find about seven or eight copies of it where he's at. Well, on Amazon, oh, it was not around here. It was $65 for weeks on yeah. end. The, all of the Fire Emblem games are expensive, like the, the Game Boy Advance carts, yeah. the the GameCube one, the DS one. They're all expensive, and it's just it's crazy because I really you know want to get into the series. Like besides um, Awakening, I, I don't have that one either, but I really want to get those ones on the the Game Boy Advance and the GameCube, you know, and and buy them on online somewhere. And it's just they're just ridiculous. Like that series has has some devoted fans and uh, well everyone never, it has really taken off up till now i think yeah. this one's probably going to go down as you know probably the best selling in the series and uh yeah i mean it's just nuts to try and find those games online yeah you're going to see those prices go up and up and up because everyone's got a taste of it now and they're gonna be like oh yeah. i want the other ones and so i mean yeah, yeah. i played a rom a little bit of the first one and I I know it's awesome like the first one on the Game Boy Advance and I, I just really want it and then you know Steven goes and finds one for five freaking dollars <laughs> but anyway <laughs> is um, this a good price? is this a good price <laughs> I was, for just, fire <laughs> I was uh, rubbing it in I'm sorry <laughs> dude you're an asshole <laughs> not really uh, but, uh, but that I was a really awesome three. <laughs> that is a really awesome find though and see, yeah. it's just like you know, I th- I want that kind of a find on those games because I don't want to spend thirty, forty bucks for a freaking Game Boy Advance card. Stupid. Actually, we have that free on our as a 3DS ambassador. I have it for free already on the D uh, the D 3DS. But it was cool to have a physical Gee, copy now. So. What a dickhead! God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ambassador. Meanwhile, Chance is over there crying his eyes out. <laughs> Yeah, man, I'm gonna I'm gonna have trouble sleeping tonight. I'm just gonna cry. I'm just gonna. I was gonna say, yeah, uh, awake. I was at Best Buy last Sunday, and Awakening had there's like seven copies at Best Buy here, so it's easy to come by here. So if anyone needs a <laughs> copy, uh, uh, if you if you find a, a 3ds for like ten bucks laying around somewhere, you know, I'll pay. You had money. mentioned TG had said, uh, yeah, that Tomb Raider had sold in the three million range, and I'm looking at. Thirteen two because you know we're getting a thirteen three and cross platform between Xbox and PS three it only sold two million or let's see I'm looking at it here yeah it only sold two point three million yet that's getting another sequel so to think that Tomb Raider it's at three it, it just uh, it boggles my mind that that is a fantastic number right now to think that's disappointing. And still, I mean, here we're just in the first couple months. I'm sure when the holidays roll around, there's going to be a couple hundred thousand off the shelves. But that's disappointing to hear that they're disappointed in that number because that sounds like a great number to me. Well, I think Hitman actually personal. did pretty well too. What was this that? Oh, I said I think Hitman, uh, the latest one, did oh. pretty well too, and it it was mentioned as doing uh, disappointing numbers. Hmm. So they're doing they're, they're making games that are doing well. They're publishing them, but not good enough. Well, it's okay though because they're they're taking the manuals out, so they're still making all their money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've I've had two DS games in the past month with no manual: uh, Castlevania and um, Etrian Odyssey Four. Well, I you know I just got those Vita games, and it was so disappointing to crack oh. <laughs> open every brand new one, and there's just nothing in there. But there's, there's still a little thing there to hold the manual in there, but it's, it's just Insult the game. To injury. Part. Yeah, it's just like ha ha. <laughs> Each of the tabs, that little feed of game card. Yeah. I've never even seen I one. Mean, are they are they small? Oh yeah, they're tiny. Yeah. Yeah, I I've never seen the game. I haven't seen a 3ds. Well, yeah, I have. I was say what, what the hell am I talking about? So for some reason I was thinking <laughs> that the 3ds games were like a lot smaller too, but they're not. They're like the same size. They appear to be anyway. I I was kind of so, thinking, you know, I was kind of thinking with uh, kind of off topic here, but. You know, what would it have been to throw a UMD drive into the Vita, at oh. least the first model, no, no. like to try, and, to try and sell it a little bit better? Because, I mean, obviously it hasn't sold, you know, very well at all. But a guy like me, you know, I've got a Model 1000 PSP, 
you know, and it's going to die, you know, before I want it to, I'm sure. And I'm going to have to buy another PSP, but it would be awesome if I could get, you know, the first edition Vita that had both ports. But obviously that's not a thing, so I, am, I think it would have sold better, though. I am so happy that there's not a UMD drive on this thing, <laughs> because <laughs> well, I'm, though. I am just sitting here waiting for my, I mean, I'm just, honestly, I'm just sitting here waiting for my PSP, that UMD drive to fail. And I just, I feel like, um, you know, maybe there's going to be other things on the Vita that's going to fail. But I at least know like that, the uh, huh? Sales? Like the sales? Yeah. But yeah, I at yeah, least know bad. that after 30 years of video game technology, we have got the cartridge down pat. We know how to make it so they, the, the, at least the, the cartridge drive will always work. Everything else yeah. might break, but that cartridge drive is going to work fine. Yeah, I, I kind of want to beat it too, but I just can't justify the price tag right now just because I was like, yeah, there's probably enough games that I would play, but there's a lot more on the 3DS right now that I would want personally, so that's that's where I'm, I'm headed. And I think, too, partially because there are so many actual DS games, original DS games that I don't have yet, and, you know, it's backwards compatibility, you know, kind of a recurring theme here that I want in my systems. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's going to be really good, especially because I don't personally have a DS. The DS I'm using is actually my niece's. So, I mean, she doesn't mind, you know, that I'm using it because, you know, she doesn't play it that much anyway. But for me, it's uh, it's going to be, a, you know, a dual system. It's going to, you know, be for both. So it's it's a really good investment for me when I, when I finally get there. But the Vita, it just... Personally, I mean, it looks cool, like from the the footage that I've seen, and I think I was tossing this around the other day. It's like, what would it be, you know, if I was to just get rid of all my consoles and go straight handheld? You know, but I couldn't do that. You wouldn't have Wizards and Warriors anymore. I know that would be tragic. And before, but Stephen, before you 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 jump in there, I just want to say when I when Chance and I were having our discussion about the UMD drives, I could just imagine Grub Gun listening in on it, going Vita <laughs> cartridges. <laughs> Fucking cartridges again, man. <laughs> you know. <laughs> good, good impression. I was gonna say, uh, no, with the uh, the sales numbers, um, two things. Don't be surprised. Like, I hope we see a Vita price drop for people this fall, so we can get some more uh, buyers behind it, so we can get some more quality Japanese games over here for it. But uh, I mean, and look at Sony's uh, history with the first PSP. I mean, they had to go and everything that was just digital only. Don't be surprised if you see another model of a Vita come out where you're not going to have cartridges and you can just download everything and that might be cheaper. I don't which know. would be I think, unfortunate, I think, but... I think they've yeah, I won't buy that one. That. Yeah, I, I, I won't be buying that. that one. But then, cha- I mean, uh, yesterday, Dustin's had to travel to how many stores to find a Vita? Oh, oh, Maybe oh. the problem... <laughs> Maybe the problem is they're not putting enough on shelves to make money off of. Maybe that could be another thing. That I should tell. I mean, that's a good because I went to my GameStop. My my because I like the guys that work there. I was like, I'm gonna give them my money. You know, I go in there and I'm looking and I wanted to get uh, I wanted to get Gravity Rush and I um, I was thinking about getting another uh, RPG style game, but uh, I didn't get it. Um, and I was like, well, the one, they didn't have Gravity Rush there. So I was like, all right, well, at least I can buy the console here. So I just wanted the Wi-Fi version. No Wi-Fi. They had a 3G one, you know, if I wanted to get that monstrosity. But it had the higher price tag, right? Right. And then I looked up and I saw all those bundles, you know, and they had, you know, they had the display boxes of all the bundles. And I was like, well, maybe Assassin's Creed 3 wouldn't be that bad of a game. So I was like, well, how much for the uh, Assassin's Creed 3 one? Oh, we don't have that one either. And I'm like, are you serious? (laughs) And he's like, yeah, uh, they just, we don't, we don't have any of them. And so he's like, we well, want me to call the mall? And I was like, well, sure, call the mall. You know, it's only like two minutes away. We have two GameStops like right next to each other. Um, yeah. So they call over there. Of course, they have nothing, nothing. They don't even have a Vita wow. in the store. So I remember that Meyer had a bunch of them in there. So I was like, all right, well, I'll just run over to Meyer real quick and get one. Sure enough, they had a bunch. They had uh, like four Wi-Fis and then like 27 3G ones. Um, so I was like, yeah, I'll take one of the Wi-Fi ones. And then I got uh, Wipeout there as well, but then their game selection sucked ass as well. So I got Wipeout, and I was like, alright, well, I'll go to the mall, because I know they have a used copy of Gravity Rush. And I went there, and sure enough, they still had that copy of Gravity. So I had to go to three different stores to try to get track this thing down. 
And like that, then I, I, that's why I sent you guys that message. And Steven's like, well, you know, maybe everyone just wants a Vita now. And I don't think that's the case. I just think, like, I don't think Walmart even carries the Vita anymore. I think I read that somewhere that Walmart's starting to not carry it anymore. So I think these, these stores just aren't restocking because the thing's not moving. But then again, it's like chicken before the egg. If they don't have it on stock to sell, you know, how are they going to sell it? So. And, and I know you're probably really happy with that you were at least able to find one. But uh, I was going to tell you here around Meyer at the Best Buy oh, still, I, they have the bundles, 234 for the Liberation bundle here. Yeah. Well, you want to know what happened? My Best Buy, <laughs> my best buy caught on fire. It's temporarily. <laughs> oh, yeah, we'll be saying that. It yeah. did catch on fire. <laughs> so. That stinks. But you, you can get a bundle cheaper than the original model, which is well, kind of boggled my mind, too. So. They, Sony is so stupid. They need to. You know when they're going to price drop that thing. They're going to price drop it once the PS4 comes out. That's what they're waiting. Oh, yeah. But if, if they they are losing so much ground right now with this thing, they need to price drop it right now. I'm well, one thing you mentioned in deal with the PS4. So. <laughs> well, one thing Dustin that. mentioned in, in his video is there's the the added cost of the memory cards, which is insane. Uh, in I max I maxed out my card long because I have like I said a number of titles on PSN and. In regards to, uh, you know, 4 might change things, but for the PS3, PSP, and PS Vita, it's it's really seamless. You know, you hit the button and it says whatever is compatible with your Vita just has a download button by it. And so if it's a PSP game compatible or a PlayStation 1 or whatever, uh, but I maxed out that card a long time ago. And I, I almost got a 16 gigabyte card on sale through AT&T for $50. And they actually shut the sale off and didn't give anyone their cards. But that was considered a sale. That was almost... Or right at half off, I think. What is it? A thirty-two is over a hundred dollars. It's yeah. that's a massive cost when you pick up the system. Is I remember when I first oh picked God. mine up. Yeah, I was not expecting. I thought it had some sort of internal memory, even a small amount. And the guy was telling me, if you're going to put anything on the system, get a four gig card. And that was just uh, that was like a quarter of the price of the system right off the bat. Yeah, my my sixteen oh. gig card was sixty six bucks. Oh my yeah. God! Holy 16, 16 gigs. You know, I thought it was only oh twenty nine anyway. No, that's that for the hurt. eight gig. Oh that's the eight gig because it goes four, eight, sixteen, thirty two, and yeah, uh, there's no like the stores I were at. They didn't even have the thirty two gigs. They're like, fuck that noise. No one's gonna buy that. <laughs> no one has. Yeah, no one's gonna buy that. No one. Yeah, the thirty two retails for a hundred dollars, but Amazon has it for eighty. That is. I just bought a 32 gigabyte flash drive or jump drive for for 7.99 from Office yeah. Depot. Yeah, it's like I, I know that memory doesn't cost that much. And like the hard drive stuff, you can and get like a you can get like a a terabyte external computer hard drive for like you know, 50 bucks, something like that. And that's a freaking terabyte. Good grief! And they did I, the same thing with the memory stick Pro for the PSP. I remember having to pay. You know, at the time it was uh, like price and a half just to get the equivalent of the storage for a memory duo pro which nothing but sony camcorder tvs and the psp uses so now that's worthless yeah <laughs> thank god nintendo just went with an sd card because i have it i, yeah, I that's have a, a lifesaver i have a 32 gig sd card in my um 3ds and when i bought that thing i was like woo you know because i thought oh this thing's gonna be great and i think i paid maybe 20 bucks for that 20 30 bucks ridiculous absolutely highway robbery what it does. Go Nintendo. Go Nintendo. <laughs> well, since we're on the Vita, Dustin, how was your first night with it? Did you enjoy I your put, time, or do you want to wait until we talk about the games you've been playing? I'm, well, we can... I mean, that's fine. I can talk about the Vita. Um, I put in Wipeout 2048, and my eyes melted in my skull. Uh, oh, yeah. It That... There's... You know, there's no way to get around how gorgeous that screen is. And the entire time I'm playing these games... Um, I'm just sitting here going, fuck, E sell Seta in the fall, E sell Seta in the fall. Uh, uh, oh, I can't wait. Absolutely can't wait. Oh, yeah. So that's it for your first night? Oh, I'm sorry. You want me, you want me to, <laughs> you want me to go into the details about how I, uh, um, seduced it and... Yes, how you we caressed want, it. We want the meat and how, how, how I played with those, uh, those lovely knobs that it has. <laughs> Um, <laughs> How do you like the feel of it? Did you get a grip for it? Do you have the natural, or are you just holding it naturally I'm, without a grip? Or? I'm holding it naturally right now. There is this kind of nice rubberized grip at GameStop. It's like 14 bucks. 
I mean, it's literally just like a piece of you know cheap rubber that you just put around the the system. But it, it when I held it in my hand in the store, it felt nice. So I'm thinking I'm going to get that for it. Um, but yeah, I, I like everything about it. I, I I think the face buttons are a little too small. Um, yeah. People are complaining Agreed. about the control sticks. When I'm playing Gravity Rush, um, aside from the controls being a little wonky in that game anyway, I find the sticks to be very, very comfortable. Um, I wish that instead of them doing the normal PlayStation, you know, both control sticks on the bottom, I really wish they would, you know, follow the Microsoft way of having one control stick above the D-pad and one control stick below, you know what I mean? Because that just feels more natural to you, because no one uses a D-pad. Like, the only game I'm using a D-pad for is Luminous and Cinemori. Yeah. No, I'm not even using it for Cinemori. Uh, I'm using the, the control stick. So the control stick should be above the, con- the, the D-pad. Uh, I love D-pads, but in this day and age, they're kind of obsolete. Um, You'll find when you get that grip, it'll kind of help you with the positioning of your hands on yeah, the Yeah, I, I can feel that. that pad. Yeah. Um, I love how big it is and how kind of chunky it is. I mean, it's not chunky. But it's just, it's big, you know what I mean? Um, because yeah. a lot of times when I'm playing my PSP, um, my ring finger and my pinky on both hands will go to sleep. Like, I'll have, to, I'll have to pause it, set it down, and like rub my fingers to get feeling back into them. Which probably means I have carpal tunnel. But um, <laughs> I get that with my 3DS as well when I don't have the Circle Pad Pro on it. But uh, I am, I, I, I just, I am flabbergasted at why this system is not selling better because it is a gorgeous piece of hardware. And um, But then again, they don't have any real games for it, you know? It's kind of all niche stuff, like Persona 4 the Golden is like the biggest, you know, title on it right now. Have you been happy with your uh, big fan of... TG? You guys just talk all over each other. Yeah, I, I said I know TG, that our... You, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Go to... Me first! I said... I know that our guest is a big fan of the Vita and Persona 4 Golden. Oh yeah, um, my my Vita has really just become like a little portable role playing role playing game machine because I, through the PSN they recently had some some sales, so I got Final Fantasy IX for four dollars and ninety nine cents. Um, I have Armored uh, not Armored Core Front Mission on it, and a bunch just stack on the memory card, and it's nice to well I like physical copies. What's especially nice about the Vita is that uh, since it has a USB port, you could hook it up to your PlayStation 3 and move your save over. So if I ever did buy a physical copy, I could just back it up with a, a memory card on an adapter and you know bring it into the other room where I have my PlayStation 1 and 2. And um, But something like PlayStation, uh, Persona 4 Golden really shows what uh, a re-release in general should be. I mean, they have uh, supplementals in there that I've never seen in other games. You can watch concert video footage of live performances of the music. Um, there's a game show quiz part of it. They recorded entirely new dialogue just for that section. Uh, yeah, I put well over 100 hours into that game. That was that was well worth it. Probably one of my favorite games of all time. I uh, I, I browsed through the PSN store, and I got to tell you, when I see that I can download like Alundra and Vanguard Bandits for six bucks a pop, it really makes it hard for me to go onto Amazon and plop down 30, 40 bucks for those games. Uh, you know, I really think like I, I have my collection and I'm very pleased with it. And there's still some physical stuff that I want to get. But man, when I see like I can get a Lundra for six bucks on PSN, I'm just it's hard to pass that up. Yeah, like I said, uh, mine's just become a little portable library. I have tons of PlayStation uh, One role playing games on it, and you know it's it's nice anytime you want to back out of it. There's tons of features for um, optimizing uh, the resolution. There's you can use all four panes on the the back touch panel uh, in conjunction with the front if you feel like it. Uh, like I don't like the back touch panel very much, so in front mission I swap those for the front. So I just tap the top right or left corner. And that takes care of L, takes care of L2 and R2. So they have a ton of optimization and uh, customization options for people who want to play. You know, the only thing I didn't uh, I had problems with are fighting games because that directional pad is really small for fighting games. And I put uh, Street Fighter Alpha 2 on it. And as sad as it is, I preferred it on the PlayStation Portable because um, as bad as that directional pad is, it was still better than this one for fighting. But like I said, this is mainly for platformers, racers, and role playing games. And yeah, like Dustin said, you can get it for six to ten dollars a copy or go on Amazon or eBay and see a uh, you know physical one for anywhere fifteen thirty. It, it makes it difficult. So I just tell myself 
in the future, I'll just back up my save if I get a physical and when I know I'm never going to grab a physical copy. It'll just stay on this. And I have uh, Final Fantasy IX and Wild Arms uh, on mine, and they even, like, to me, they look better than, like, right now, I just have the flat screen in the game room, so that's when I'm playing PS1 titles on. It just looks really good as far as, like, the pixels and stuff on the Vita screen, and like TG was saying, it just has so much customization for screen sizes and stuff that it, it is tough to beat downloading. Even Crash Bandicoot now, for some reason, has jumped up to skyrocket prices, just the first one. And, I mean, to download that for five ninety nine, I mean, stuff like that. The PSN store is really stepping up as far as some good classics to download for really cheap. Can you get the Lunars on there? I, I can't remember if you, I saw them on there or not. I, yeah, I looked it up after I bought the PlayStation portable version. Someone said that it had a really bad load time, so I looked on the PS Store, and it, uh, the one I got, I forgot the, what the subtitle was, but yeah, it was available for, I think, $9, and I paid 15 or so for the, the UMD version. That's good. I always want Lunar to be available to people, because I think people need to go play Lunar. I think it also corrects the uh, the loading from some of the reviews I read. The loading is much faster. Oh, know, so it's it's, it's taken the PS- straight from the card. It's the PS right? Yeah, it's, it's the PS. Okay, mm-hmm. I thought PSP it was the PS one the PS one versions. Okay. Oh, sorry, no, I'm not sure if that's on there, but the the portable version is, and okay. yeah, it was cheaper that I paid for the the physical copy, and it's supposed to be improved as well. So. I think it's Silver Thumbs Star on that Harmony. One, I guess. Yeah, Silver Star Harmony is the PSP version. That, that's the one on PSP. I don't think the other one's on PSP. That sucks. I really want to play those. Kind of fizzled out there. No, no, but I hear like a lot of wind on wind? a yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna blame. Go ahead and blame Steven. But <laughs> hey, um, it got clear now, so we're all good. So okay. <laughs> and just for a second there, it's, I heard some robot voices. I'm well, like, oh, no. It's nowhere near as bad as that one night with Chance. That was... It's like, a, is Chance downloading a game again in the background? What's going on? <laughs> no, but I, I, I did have a fan running, though, so that was probably it. <laughs> that's, probably, that's probably the wind blowing across it, Chance's it, mic. It was me! But no, I... Um, God, I just... I wish companies would put more into the Vita. I... I mean, I, I'm going to get e Celseta, and there's a couple, you know, Persona for the Golden, and, you know, everyone says as long as there's, like, two or three great games on a system, it's worth owning. Take that for what it is. But um, I, I think the Vita, especially if you're somebody new into gaming and you want to get a lot of those old PS1 RPGs, um, aside from having to pay a crazy amount for a memory card, um, this is a great way to play a lot of those old school PS1 RPGs. I'm interested to see. And, uh, I know we're getting X and X2 and HD. Uh, I'm hoping they have an, uh, another original Final Fantasy game coming down the line for the Vita. I think it'd be great, but who knows? It's like an exclusive? Oh, yeah. Like uh, Crisis Core was for the PSP, so just something. Oh, yeah, I can see. They could port, they could port Type-0. Oh, I'd love that. Please make it I was happen. always kind of hopeful for like a physical <laughs> copy of Dimension. I think that they should do that. Never heard of it. Final Fantasy Dimensions? Dimensions. Oh, Dim- <laughs> I was like, just Dimensions. That kind of confused me. Yes, oh, Final, Final Fantasy, Fantasy Dimensions. Dimensions. Because I want to play it, but I, I just don't want to put it on my iPhone because it's, I just hate, if I had an iPad, I might consider it, you know, because it's just a little bit bigger and uh, easier for my, my sausage fingers to handle. But, uh, yeah, I just don't want to download it on my phone just because I don't like the crampedness of it. I recommend but, uh, it on the iPad. I, I've heard I've heard you talk about. It. I think I watched your video too, and you said it's a pretty awesome uh, new game. You know, but it's a, a throwback to the old style. I you, thought that was pretty cool. What were you gonna say, TG? I think you're gonna talk right into my I, I do not remember. So. <laughs> Well, we're going to make you talk now about uh, something uh, I'm really interested in hearing about, and that's your your background in uh, video gaming. Uh, can you touch on that a little oh. bit and how you're actually into game design or game development? Uh, well, I'm on the production side, uh, so not not really any yeah. the, the design stage. Yeah, I've been doing it for about six years, and I think at this point it's about 40-some-odd titles, um, everything from strategy games to MMOs, um, 
originally it was for titles that didn't sell particularly well over here, uh, but the genres have really picked up lately, so it's nice that I can talk to people. I had a friend from high school tell me he was uh, playing something I worked on, and he, he saw my name in it, and so it was nice to have that actually happen, because for years I'd say, and everyone, never heard of it, what is that? And like, oh, well, <laughs> trust me, it's, it's, it's a real thing, and it's out there. I'm not making this up. Um, I worked on... <laughs> Uh, I was surprised. Uh, we worked on a browser-based uh, free-to-play role-playing game, and those do extremely well. I was not expecting that. Um, that was about an eight-month project. Um, a lot of stuff on the iOS. I'm working on something now for that. Um, helping a company out of Europe establish their uh, U.S. branch and putting out some of their stuff on the, the mobile market. Uh, but I've worked with more, on more traditional stuff too, like PlayStation 3 and DS and things like that. It's um, kind of sometimes we involve just at the tail end to help clean things up. Other times we're we're with them from the very beginning and we pass stuff back and forth and we just try to help them work out any errors uh, in a lot of different areas along the way. Uh, it's not quality assurance in terms of bugs, although we'll certainly pass that along if we encounter them. It's really uh, everything for the the production side, so audio. Uh, graphics, text, all sorts of stuff. And um, like I said, I've been there about six years, and uh, yeah, it's been pretty fun. I don't talk about too much on the channel, though. Uh, I've never talked of, about anything I've worked on on the channel either, so I always keep that separated. Is this a, a smaller type company that's kind of like a freelance company who anyone can come to, or are there contracts well, yeah, with certain well, people you can only work with? I've had contracts with a few before, but what happened is around 2010, uh, kind of when the the market bottomed out for a lot of people. Um, it happened in 2009, but we had several big projects that pushed us into 10. And in January 2010, one company canceled five, and they just never released those. Another one canceled four or five. I think in total we had 15 canceled within a two-month period in 2010. And once that kind of rolled along, more and more companies canceled. Uh, or they just didn't release their stuff over here. And a few that we actually were paid for and worked on in 2009, they couldn't afford or find anyone to bring it out. So there's been a few that we spent months on that have never been released anywhere. Like I have uh, beta copies of them on disk somewhere that you can't access anywhere else except for whoever else worked on it. Um, and so since then, we kind of pared down, and uh, the people I worked with kind of – they went their own way, but whenever you know a project comes in, I'll get in touch with them and we'll start working together again. But uh, before it was st steady enough to where you know they were just employees, but uh, it bottomed out so bad that they had to go and get uh, you know freelance themselves. And so I still talk to pretty much everyone though. And um, so anytime a project needs to, I can get a big pool of people together. But you know, there's no way we can support that many people anymore. So it's all project based these days. I was going to say, would that have been something when a when a developer or someone had to come to you for that? Uh, were would y'all's commission or pay be based on sales of game? Would that be something they'd have to oh, pay no. straight up for, and then uh, you do yeah, work? they pay they pay they pay straight up. We agree on it beforehand, um, and if the budget's tight, uh, like the company that's establishing their offices now, uh, it's pretty loose. We'll help them out however we can, and you know we'll just bat numbers around back and forth. There's nothing concrete because we'll try to help them out as much as we can. Um, we've had, uh, well, this is one time we signed a four uh, title deal and this is how, uh, people wonder how things go off the rails a lot of times in games. This is how bad it was where, so we did two of them and we're waiting on material for the third and I read on a gaming website, it's been canceled. And so mm. I got a hold of the, my contact there and they were like, oh yeah, you know, we're not doing that anymore. Sorry. Like, how long has this been canceled? Oh, a few weeks. So they didn't bother telling us and, you know, we were I had you know ten people waiting for the material, and they just eh, didn't feel like telling anyone. And so, uh, <laughs> yeah, so that was that stung. But most of the time these days, it's uh, per project because they'll try to do it in house, or you know, they might go with someone else if we're busy, or just you know have. It's really based on who you know in the companies, and that's what makes it difficult. If someone leaves one company, uh, you might not have ever talked to anyone else at that company, and so yeah. no one really know who you are. And so one guy um, who I'm working with now, he worked at a company. We did six or seven titles for them, and then he left the industry altogether, and then he came back. And uh, I, I, might, I think I mentioned this on a pickup video or something where he, I got a, a phone call from, from him, and he was saying, uh, you know, is your inbox broken? I was like, no, who is this? And he said, hey, it's, it's me. I sent you an email, and I look at it, and he's responding to an email in 2000. 
uh, late 2012 that I sent him in 2010 because he's now back oh. into gaming. And I was like, oh, okay, yeah, hey, I didn't get to your email in three hours. You waited two-plus years, so how's it going? But, yeah, that's what makes that's it frustrating is the second yeah, one guy leaves, no one knows who you are. And so even collecting your money, unless you, you're in contact with their accounting department or whatever, can be difficult because a lot of times they'll keep their contacts to themselves. We work with a lot of co uh, companies out of uh, Eastern Europe and Central Europe, and uh, they, they can be really private <laughs> with who they work with. And you're going, you know, hey, I'm over, you know, we, we, we've done all of this, and they'll have to go check with the person who left. And, uh, yeah, it can get confusing, but these days it's per, we agree a price beforehand, and it's per title. Very rarely do we do package deals after they canceled. Uh, one, that one can yeah. company canceled something and didn't tell us. That's crazy to know that so many games uh, go through and – or you think are going to come out like you saw so many cancellations within a short period of time. Was that just a regular thing around that time, or is there just so many games oh, that, that people yeah, that, are talking about that never come out? Well, that was around the time when the, the big recession hit. and so. But for a long time, the companies we were dealing with were insulated from it, and so we didn't have to worry about it. And then we also had the big MMO, a big MMO project we were on. So that extended even further for us. So by the time that ended, and we, you know, we already had the, the other ones booked, but when they canceled and we looked around, there was nothing else to do. <laughs> so you're just kind of twiddling your thumbs and waiting for something to happen. Uh, but, yeah, it, it was really around that time. And since then, a lot of the companies just never came back. They went under completely. Uh, probably four or five went under completely. That, that's got to be cool just to be able to say, like, you're part of the gaming industry, like working in and stuff. I, I wish I could say something like that just to be a part of it. Whether it's a tester or anything. Just being a part well, we feel of so office. out of the loop most of the time, I don't even say it. So <laughs> We just get dumped <laughs> stuff, and they tell us to do it, and so we just do it, and that's it. Like uh, We don't really go to trade shows or, or conventions. We'll get phone calls to do it every now and then, but I live in Louisiana. I'm not going to spend the money to, to fly out to California for the Game Developer Conference when I could just talk to them over email. So, What did you find more uh, the most easy to work on? Was that browser stuff, was that pretty easy to work on, or was working on console <laughs> stuff the easiest, PC stuff? Oh, well, the browser stuff was kind of funny because uh, we were hired by a middle company, and so I didn't know it. I didn't know they were the middle company. I thought uh, they were directly tied to the project, but they weren't. And so they hired four or five other companies, including ours. And so when we were passing notes, it was filtering through them, through someone else they hired, and then to the original company. So we would get these notes back that were gibberish, and some of them were really defensive, and other ones would be really well-informed. So we finally asked one, <laughs> like, who are these people? Well, the well-informed ones were the client, and the rude ones and the gibberish ones were the other companies they hired. They filtered, I don't know why, but a question and answer to, like, there was one, someone's gender changed like four times in one paragraph. <laughs> and wow. the name could have been for anyone, so we said, who is this? And the response was something like, why would a man be pregnant? And so there was no one pregnant. And so we sent a little question and answer form back to the, the person who hired us, like, what are they talking about? And they just said, oh, we don't know. Ignore them. And eventually uh, it got it settled out where, oh, they're passing this through three companies that shouldn't get it before the people who know these things get it. And so it, it got really confusing, and that was the – dealing with these massive spreadsheets and stuff for MMOs, and that was uh, – pretty difficult um the browser based one we've, we've done some traditional mmos and those are much more straightforward because they were also by companies who had a lot of in-house staff who did a lot of much better work than the like kind of middleman we hired we, we worked with on that one awesome he was telling the, you know, all those oh, yes yeah, so i was gonna say he was telling all those stories about you know games that would come in and then they'd be working on them and then all of a sudden get canceled and my brain instantly went to trails in the sky second chapter <laughs> I don't think we're ever going to see that thing, but I was like, oh, you reminded me of it. We had one come out last year that we worked on in 2008, and they didn't use any of the material we provided. We got paid for it. It sat on the shelf somewhere, and whoever bought the rights to it last year, they must not have bought, I guess, like the supplemental work done on it because us and a few other companies had kind of hammered it out to be you know, more polished, and none of that was in there. And so when it came out, you know, we were kind of excited to see it finally release, and you, you're going through it, and it's, it's just terrible. It's crashing all the time. Like, there's graphical anomalies. There's audio problems. There's text problems. And it's it a bunch turns of out, pregnant men. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, the same, that's the same project. The, the people got so mad at us for asking so many questions 
that in one of the cells it said, "Hey guys, why don't you call one eight hundred? Fuck off!" <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's yeah, so what I brought it. Yeah, I brought it to the attention of the people who hired us. They just said, "Oh, we're really sorry. They should have never done that." They said that was a practice exercise. <laughs> I don't know how that's a practice exercise, but all right. Uh, that's awesome. I think that my was favorite a lot of was stuff they, you just get to do from home. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, like I said, I've, I have gone through a, a few conferences and stuff like that, but most of the time we just get to do. From, I had a little office for a while, and I still do, but I don't go to it much because. Uh, the stuff we do these days doesn't really require you know that that many people, and so if there's a bigger project, I might go there just for the the quiet. But um, yeah, when things died down, I really didn't need a lot of extra stuff, so most of it is just from you know the, our homes. Awesome, you can go to your favorite thing now. Sorry. <laughs> oh well, there was uh, well some of the examples where uh, you know you, if you go here, you'll pick up the ape eye laser beam shoe. It was something like that, and we sent back, what is this? And the response was, it's a gauntlet or something. It's in Diablo, too. (laughs) (laughs) It just doesn't make any... Yeah, I have have the Excel sheet somewhere here. I'll I'll send it to one of you so you can see it, because it just makes zero sense, and, you know, they they got really mad because we kept asking questions, and finally the actual developer fired that company, like, who is asking, like, what is going on? This does not mean this. this. It's a gauntlet. Why did you call it the ape tiger leg beam <laughs> and there was another one we uh we were going over it and some of the stuff looked really good and then you get to these really weird patches and then really good and weird patches so we're going through the design documents and we kind of uh look at those make sure everything's in line that we have a bit massive nintendo glossary because it's a ds game um so we go through all that make sure all the um the lingo is correct because nintendo is real strict and then uh we noticed that some parts of the game sound much better than the rest. So I just, on a hunch, typed it in Google, and it turns out someone went through Wikipedia and copied these massive blocks of text and just stuck them in the game. And they went to other websites and just whole copied whole pages of text and put them in. And that's why it, everything about it seemed off. It's because it's from different sources, but they didn't do any original work themselves. And we corrected that five times, and we stopped correcting it when someone kept reverting it back to the original plagiarized stuff. So that oh was another goodness. fun one. Yeah, it's very conf- – I think it's really confusing uh, when you, we talk to the people who, are, dire- who you know, are talking to the producers. They don't know what's going on either. Someone along the way is doing this, and no one's fessing up. So after a while, you just – all right, well, we've done what we can here. <laughs> Leave the Wikipedia entry in if you want. <laughs> wow. Do you got any more cool uh, stories to sh- share about the industry, or should we move on to the games we've been playing? Well, like I said, I'm pretty far removed from it, especially in Louisiana. Um, and, yeah, most of the stuff... Uh, I, it's very confusing most of the time. Like I said, things come and go, and you don't really know about it until it's too late. Or, you know, you'll send material in, and you get an email from someone you never talked to asking who you are. And it's because the person you dealt with has quit the company. Uh, there was one we were talking with LucasArts about something, and the guy had kind of set us up for a future project. He sent us Steam codes to where we could unlock every LucasArts game at the time. So we were all we were all jazzed for it, and uh, <laughs> wow. set up the next phone call. And then he's not there anymore. And we're like, well, he went to work for um, they make lenses for video cameras. He went to work for them. And the new guy that took his place had no clue who we were and was like, no, nah, we have it from here. And so we're going, no, 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 go get him on the phone and talk to him. And they're like, oh, no, no, it's okay. Yeah, he had a lot of projects in the pipeline that we don't, we don't have to worry about anymore. I got it. And you're like, no. <laughs> like, we want our Steam codes. Give us our codes. <laughs> well, then he gave, he's, he, right before the guy left, that's why we were all jazzed. He said, okay, here, get acclimated with our entire library. And here is, here's four codes for Steam that unlocks everything we've done on there. So we're we're excited. We're thinking this is a good deal. And then, yeah, he goes and works for Kodak or something, and we're going, no, 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 <laughs> get him back now, please. Man, because, yeah, like I said, he had some jobs lined up, so that could have been some good work for a little bit there. Yeah, and stuff people actually would have known about, but that was not meant to be. But, yeah, that's really it. We're pretty far removed, and I just get emails telling me we need this in a week. And so, okay, <laughs> really, that's really yeah. about it these days. And I don't know how long ago that was since LucasArts is no more. The I was just going to say that. Yeah. 
Yeah, this was like uh, a year and a half, two years ago. Yeah, yeah, I saw that the news they, they're being uh, shut down. That's, that's sad. As someone who played X Wing and Tie Fighter, I still have them at X Wing Alliance, uh, the Super Nintendo, Star Wars games, the PC adventure games. It's while they haven't been very good for a while now. Man, their back catalog is great, and to see just to know that company is going under, it stings a little. Should we not, even, not even going under. Disney's just shutting them down. <laughs> It's like yeah, yeah, we, yeah. We, we played taps and set them, send them off, right? <laughs> yeah. I wonder how, with that. Um, what is it? Thirteen, thirteen. How is that going to affect that game? Is that still going to be coming out? I don't think so. Yeah, now, unless someone picks it up, they'll look for it. Yeah, they'll, they'll look for someone, but that's about it. Dis- Disney's not going to so put it out. <laughs> I don't think so. Jesus. All right. Disney games we've been playing. I hope not. <laughs> yeah. Sure, games we've been playing. Uh, yeah. Chance, start us off. Oh, man. Okay. Um, <laughs> oh, you want to be safe for No, no, I actually don't have as many this time, surprisingly. Um, a couple, couple that I kind of touched on but hadn't spent too much time on. Um, I played Star Fox 64. Um, I played it for, you know, a good a good amount of time. I was, I was getting ready to send it, put, put it in a package and send it off to someone. Um, because they bought it from me, and then I just sat there and played it and almost beat it, and I was like, man, I really don't want to sell this game anymore. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so I played that for a while. And like I, I mentioned earlier in the podcast, I uh, played a little bit of the first Fire Emblem on the Game Boy Advance, but I played it on a ROM on my computer, and I really, really liked it a lot. It was, you know, a strategy RPG, but it was really easy. And when I say that, I don't mean, like, there's, that there's not a challenge. I just mean that, like, th- just the way the mechanics of the game worked, it was just, it just made sense right away, and it just didn't take very long to get, you know, kind of get into it and kind of, you know, get behind what was going on. So I, I really enjoyed that, and I am um, going to track down a copy of that eventually. Um I also played a little bit of a ROM of Lufia, uh, the first one for uh, Super Nintendo, and that game seems like it's pretty awesome. So I've got it on my radar now to try and look for a copy of that, too. It looks like it's about a $30 game, $30 to $35 game. I I actually thought it was a little bit more expensive um, than it is because most of the Super Nintendo RPGs are well. Most Super Nintendo games in general are, are kind of expensive nowadays, um, but uh, especially the RPGs. Um, but like I said, I didn't put too much time into that. Actually, uh, the the emulator that I was using kind of crashed at that moment, and uh, I hadn't saved, so I you know I just didn't bother going back and and playing some more. Um, but other than that, um, after I decided that I really liked Star Fox 64, I put in Project Sofied, a uh, uh, Square Enix game, sure, you know, pretty much, you know, like your Star Fox clone, I guess, in that style of shooting. I don't know what you call that. What, what do you call that kind of a game? Looks that, that's not really on rails, is it? Well, Star Fox is on rails. I don't okay. know about Sofied. Well, I don't know. Well, it's it's kind of the same. I mean, I just didn't know. I thought it. I don't know. I I guess I don't really understand completely what the name on rails means. Um, but uh, that's pretty much the same style. But uh, I've heard it said that this this game is one of the more complex games because every button on the 360 controller does something. It does something different. So that was pretty crazy. It's like yeah, you know, you really gotta remember where all the buttons are because there's different kinds of missiles and you got like a machine gun and uh, one of them is for your booster and you know one of them is to switch um switch missile types and and all these different things and it, it was it was kind of confusing but to get to get used to it in the beginning but it is kind of a fun little shooter um it's it's a little bit harder than i thought it would be um but uh, my disc uh just decided to crap out and I lost some progress but uh, not too bad I, I probably lost about an hour's worth of progress but um, it's fun enough and you know it's the type of game that I can go back and do it again and you know not really care just because it is just to shoot them up um, but it's it's got seems, seems to be a, de- a decent story um, it's kind of like a, there's uh, some turmoil going on they, they, like a, a war of some kind uh, some against some some star colonies or something that have of uh, kind of 
uh, rebelled against the, you know, whatever, the government and kind of made their own government. So typical story, but uh, it's it seems to be okay. Um, next, I, I didn't play that one for very long, probably just about two hours, two and a half hours, something like that. Um, Marvel vs. Capcom 3, uh, a gift from T.G. Apuleius, our guest this evening. I did put that in and had a ton of fun with it. I love the first two. Um, and this was actually the first fighting game that I played on the 360. And I wasn't sure how I was going to feel about it, um, but I, I really I really liked it. Uh, the controls seemed to be pretty good, and I love the over-the-topness of the game. You know, the the uh, your special attacks, you know, fill the entire screen, and, you know, it's just kind of over-the-top fighting, and it, it's pretty awesome. I play a little bit of Street Fighter 4, too, but that game is freaking hard on the 360. Uh, the control, the controls for that one just seem to just really not click with me very well. But uh, I'll play it some more in the future. Uh, but like I said, I, I played that one through. I beat it a couple of times on arcade mode, just, just on the easier uh, difficulty with several different characters. I really liked Dante uh, as a character from... The Devil May Cry games and uh, Iron Man. I well, he's always a standby. And uh, who else do I use? The the Wolf from Okami, whatever her name is, I can't remember. But I used her on one of them. Uh, Akuma from Street Fighter Alpha and Wolverine. You know, I I didn't play as all the characters, but I played as several, and it's it's pretty it's awesome fighting line. game. You know, I did a little bit. Um, it, uh, I don't think I did very well, but uh, <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't figure out um, how to do it, I don't think. And on Street Fighter Four, it was frustrating because I was just trying to play to test it out, and people kept, like, challenging me. And, like, I would be playing against people online and just getting my ass kicked. And it's like, uh, okay, how do I not do this? How do I not play online here? Um, but uh, Street Fighter, uh, Marvel vs. Capcom 3 seemed to be a little bit easier for me to, to handle. Maybe it's just because I played the first two. I, I don't know. But uh, I played those on the Dreamcast, so I don't know how it would transfer to 360. Um, but, uh, yeah, do you have that game, Steven? Uh, I have Super Street Fighter 4 Arcade Edition. No, I meant uh, Marvel vs. Capcom 3. Had it and got rid of it because I couldn't get into the gameplay of it. All the juggling and stuff. I'm more of a Street uh, Fighter guy. All right, well, I'll let you kick my ass as Street Fighter later. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, other games, uh, the last three are actually the, the three that I spent the most time on. Um, I Well, I guess I should mention, I, I borrowed the, the Sonic Genesis collection from a friend of mine again, and I, I played through almost all the way through Sonic 2, uh, the first Sonic game that I've actually played. Um, I'm not a big, not a really big Genesis, uh, Sega guy. Um, but I'm having fun with that, and I played Super Thunderblade quite a bit too. But that's really all the time I've been on that Genesis collection for now. Um, but like I said, these last three I've just been playing quite a bit. Um, first and foremost has been Dissidia Final Fantasy. I'm still really trying to finish this game. I think I was I think I was playing it last time too, uh, last podcast. I, I just been uh, haven't been playing it as much. For some reason, I tend to only play my PSP when I'm laying in bed, and then I just get too tired and like fall asleep with it on. And one partially one reason I guess is my PSP battery sucks so much; it only lasts for about 45 minutes to an hour. So I constantly have to be near an outlet, and my I just kind of leave my charger plugged in by the bed. So I don't know. I just I just haven't been making that much progress, but. I played it for maybe an hour and a half today. I'm finally on the ninth crystal now uh, using uh, Zidane. Uh, I think I'm about halfway through that too, but then I'll move on, play the tenth one, and then go into the the actual um, main story, I guess. What, what is it called again, Steven? I forgot. The main storyline? Yeah, the ones you have to the unlock. For, uh, oh, it's been so long now. Impulse storyline. <laughs> Yeah, that's it. Impulse, yeah. Um, and then I think you said that there's four of those. Your video on that was just really awesome. I think you did a really spot-on job of uh, describing the gameplay and stuff. That was really cool. Um, Thanks. Yeah, it was it was a really good informational uh, video. So if you want to you want to know what this game is about, um, definitely go check out Steven's video on it. It's pretty 
pretty spot on. Really great game. Having a lot of fun with it. Uh, but I'm kind of ready to be done with it because I'd like to move on to, to some other uh, PSP games that I have that I've just been putting off. Um, Mad World for the Wii. I love this game. It's uh, I play it kind of in spurts. You know, I'll play it for about an hour, hour and a half, and then I'll put it down for a couple of days and I'll come back. Uh, it's really, really cool, like gladiator style hack and slash game on the Wii. Um, it's all in black and white except for blood. I guess it's sort of comic booky. I guess in a way. Um, I really, really enjoy the gameplay. This is actually the kind of Wii game that I didn't think that I would enjoy when I first uh, bought the Wii. I didn't think I would like to play um, like the the games where you have to swing the Wii mode around and stuff like that. I was really just kind of like, yeah, I'll just get some games where I could use the the Pro controller, you know, and just you know just use it like a regular console. But then after playing this game, I really decided that I really need some more of these. Um, like hack and slash type games on the Wii. Uh, I, I think Dustin, you, uh, yeah, I guess you might talk about this game. Didn't you recently play uh, Muramasa? Well, we'll get to that when I get to the game. Okay, <laughs> that's what I thought. But that game looked pretty awesome. And then like uh, Red Steel, I hear is pretty awesome. And then the one I really want is Dragon Quest Swords. I think that that game looks pretty cool, and I'm a big fan of the Dragon Quest series, and I know that it's just a spin-off game, you know, and it's, you know, more or less, you know, in some ways, a, a Wii uh, technology game with a Dragon Quest name on it, you know, Dragon Quest Sword, you swing the sword around, um, but I don't know, it still seems like a lot of fun, so... I'm um, looking forward to uh, picking that up. And, and the cool thing about Wii games is that other than Xenoblade Chronicles and some of the other RPGs, uh, they, they aren't too expensive. I think I could get most most of the Wii games that I want for uh, 20 bucks or less, so that's pretty cool. Um, I do have quite the, quite the list of Wii games so that I do need to pick up. And then last year is a game I actually haven't played that much except for the last couple of days. I've put about, I don't know, four or five more hours into Nino Cooney, Wrath of the White Witch. I'm enjoying this game a lot more than I thought it would. Uh, for the first five and a half hours, I was just, meh. I just really didn't care that much. But for some reason, it just kind of picked up a little bit, and it's getting a little bit better, and I played it for a couple hours this morning. And Yeah, I'm, I, I'm actually finally to a point where I, I need to finish this game. So, uh, yeah, that's about it. Cool. Pick the next person. Uh, popcorn Dustin. Oh, okay. Um, well, like uh, Chance uh, led me in there, I have been playing a little bit of Muramasa, the Demon Blade, and it, I mean, if it's it's coming out on the Vita as, uh, what is it, Muramasa Rebirth, and yeah. I'm actually thinking about picking that up as well, because as beautiful as this game looks on the Wii it's going to look that much more gorgeous on the Vita. and well, it's going um, to look sexy. I can't wait. Oh, yeah. And um, it's I'm playing it on easy, which is kind of a little too easy in a lot of ways because uh, the bosses are really not giving me any challenge at all. But um, a very, very interesting sort of hack-and-slash, side-scrolling action RPG kind of game. Um, if you have a Wii... And I don't think it's that expensive. I think it's like maybe like twelve bucks or something used. I don't think it goes for that much. But if you I think can find I got mine, ten new, ten new, yeah. yeah. Um, if you can find a copy of it, definitely pick it up. It's it's one of the more interesting uh, games out there. Um, really, what I've been sinking a lot of my time into has been The Witcher Two. Um, I finally threw that in and. Um, I just did my WRPG versus JRPG uh, video, and I'd have to say that if you're a JRPG person, The Witcher 2 is the WRPG for you. Um, because the, the problem I have with Western RPGs is it's all based on choice, and you don't really feel like... Uh, it feels like those choices are so black and white that it's like, well, who, you know, who cares? Okay, I'm a bad guy. Well, I'm going to pick this one. Um, in The Witcher 2... The choices feel a lot more gray. Like, you don't really know if you're making the correct choice or not with a lot of the dialogue tree stuff. And, uh, I mean, that's the way it kind of is with the books for The Witcher as well. It's a very gray world where, you know, there, there's no real right or wrong. It's just, it just is. 
Um, and I would definitely say that um, if you guys are looking for a great, great game, definitely check out The Witcher 2. Um, I've been playing a little bit of Star Ocean Second Evolution on the PSP and uh, really enjoying that, but I haven't been putting as much time into it as I would like, so I might just hold off on, on it until I uh, can put more time into it. But I played it back in the day on the PS1, so it's nice to come back to that and uh, sort of see that story again. Uh, Vanquish on the 360. Um, I was having a really fun time with this until I got to a certain spot where you have to fight these uh, enemies that are made up of basically all the junk around the uh, the stage. And um, is this still recording? You guys still hear me? Yeah, we're here. Okay, because that, yep. that wind noise is like going in and out, and it makes it sound like everything's just dropping out. Um, so I've been playing Vanquish, and I got to the spot right after the disco dancing robots where you have to fight one of those junk uh, enemies at very close quarters, and I just can't beat the thing. And I it was... I mean, I was literally a, a like an eight-year-old child laying here on the couch, and I would die, and I'd, I'd start kicking my legs, and you know, start, <laughs> scre start screaming curse words at the screen, and finally, I'd I still think, do that. Yeah, I was like, I, I either have to put a different game in, or I'm going to break my 360 controller. Um, so, and that was on easy. So, um, I don't know if it was maybe I was just getting burned out on it and just didn't care. Uh, but uh, so I put you know that back on the shelf. I'll, I'll get back to it eventually. Uh, for the Vita, uh, I've already kind of talked about it, but um, playing Luminous, um, that's a very interesting uh, puzzle game. I really love the music in it. I'm, I'm very kind of into like electronic dance music, even though I don't have a lot of it in my CD collection. I really do enjoy um, that sort of trancey style music, so it's very awesome to sit there and listen to it, and then you get all the visuals with the game as well. Uh, Wipeout 2048. It's it, it's a fun game. It's just something I picked up just to have kind of a more of an actiony title. Um, it's fun to throw in, you know, do a race every now and then, um, and then just kind of move on to something else. Kind of like a nice little refresher from other games. Uh, Gravity Palette uh, cleanser. I'm sorry. Yeah, Palette cleanser. Oh. There you go. Um, Gravity Rush. I am actually really falling in love with Gravity Rush. I I, I knew I was going to like it when I first saw like the art style of the game and the gameplay um the controls are a little spotty in a couple places um but just the the open worldness and being able to um basically kind of fly anywhere in that game um it's really uh really a really unique game and i wish we would get more games like that that really use the technology of these systems in a very interesting way like the 3ds there really hasn't been a game yet that has used the 3D in such a way that it's, you know, maybe, what was that, Crush 3D or something like that? Uh, yeah, something like that. Yeah, but there really hasn't been a game that's like, that the 3D is a part of the gameplay. It's just, you know, it's usually just window dressing. But whereas um, Gravity Rush uses the gyroscope and the, the system, and it uses, I mean, it uses like pretty much everything that the system can throw at you um, for the game. So that's really awesome. And then I downloaded... Uh, Cine Mora on the uh, the Vita, and uh, that is a really fun uh, shoot 'em up made by uh, Grasshopper Manufacturer, which that's yeah that's Suda Fifty One's company, right? Oh yeah, yeah, and uh, very interesting shooter, um, kind of straightforward in a lot of ways. Not like a cave shooter that has all those really intricate, um, you know, different systems and everything, but uh, kind of a you know simple simple esque shooter, except for like the the ability to slow down time and things like that. But it, it tells a pretty interesting story, although it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> Isn't that one based off of you have to keep killing people or time limit will run out right. type of yeah, deal? You, you have to yeah. keep killing or you're, you have like you know very small amount of time and the more you chain um, kills, you know, you're able to restore time to keep playing. So, But uh, cool. other than that, I think that's pretty much it yeah so Choose your victim let's go with uh apuleus all righty um well in terms of uh Cinemora, i i was proud of myself on one of the levels i cracked the top of the leaderboards but then they released 
a patch and it just crushed me and I fell out of it. But for like a week, I was I was in there in the top spot, one of the top spots, and I was I was you know patting myself on the back. And then they released one that uh, they tweaked a lot of the enemy approaches, so you couldn't string together uh, combos as much. So while you might have a, the time modifier, you know, five times by the first boss, you couldn't get it quite high as early. And so that was a that was a stinging blow. So for for a brief moment though, I I flew a little too close to the sun, I guess. Um, but in terms of what I've been playing, I recently beat um, Crisis Three, uh, which is not very good. Uh, the story's about five hours, and it's uh, more open than Crisis Two, not as open as Crisis One. And they really don't use uh, Crytek did not use that space for anything whatsoever. You know, I'll be behind a wall, half a map away, I'll come uncloaked, and somehow someone sees me. I have no clue. You know, there's no way I should be on anyone's radar, but they, you know, gun straight for you. So that was uh, the last boss is just this machine with two arms, and you attack one arm at a time, and it's just a mess. You know, it's confusing. Sometimes it doesn't even work right. Uh, multiplayer was fun, though. It's very, very fast, so it feels like a Quake 3 or Unreal Tournament. Um, it's one of the most unforgiving games for uh, new players, though, because unlike other first-person shooters where the unlocks are really for uh, more capabilities and, you know, for maneuvering and just uh, tactical capabilities, this is just raw firepower. You know, you'll get bullets that explode on impact, and they'll shoot out five at a time. And I kind of knew something was up when I picked up a dead enemy's weapon, turned around and killed four guys back-to-back -back after having not killed one before that. And I was like, oh, i got to wow. stick with this for a while. Yeah, and there's a, a slide mechanic like in Brink. Uh, so you, you have to go, and if the enemy's about to grab the last flag or if they have spears in there, you do a little slide under their gunfire, and you can shoot them. And so they, they have some really good ideas. Um, the player base is pretty small, but I, I hop onto that still from time to time. I beat Castlevania uh, Lords of Shadow and Mirror of Fate recently. Uh, not a huge fan of it. They had some, some nice ideas, um, but... It's kind of clunky, I found. The cutscenes have these, this strange thing where they don't move their mouths for a lot of the words. Maybe every fourth or fifth word, they actually move the mouth, but their arms will move. So the characters are real animated, but the mouth, and there's dialogue the whole time. Um, yeah, the, the combat, the camera pulls far, far back sometimes, and it's just little blobs running around. And the only way you can tell where you are is that your the whip effect is just massive. It takes up, you know... A fifth of the screen is just your chain whip flying back and forth, and the combat system uh, unlock the. It's unlike the console when you don't pick to unlock; it just unlocks whatever for you, and you have to go into a menu to actually see what that is. And so it was just uh, some parts are nice though. The platforming is a lot better than the console version, um, but it's kind of one of those where you beat it. And it's it's not that long either, and there's n uh, not a whole lot to replay it for. That's kind of the biggest downside is there's not a lot to discover like in other Castlevanias where you kind of want to go off the beaten path and stuff. And this when you find Night Scrolls or things to extend your health or mana bar, and that's it. And they're not even really hidden. I mean, the maps are broken out in such a way they're easy to find. So that was kind of a disappointment. Um, I've been, I started Tomb Raider on the PC about three hours into that. That's pretty good so far. It does something I, I'm not never a big fan of in kind of uh, survivalist settings. Uh, Laura Croft wakes up and there's a bunch of candles lit in a cave, and I'm wondering where did you get the, where did these people get candles from? You know, this <laughs> a deserted island, and there's like 200 candles lit. What immediately struck me is you need to be preserving these candles. If this is the only cachet of candles you have, uh, you know, light one at a time. You know, but it's supposed to be one of those spooky things where you're kidnapped and you don't know what's going on. So you go there for the theme, but I'm thinking is unless someone on this island is making candles, someone is really not going for long term planning here. They need to they need to set this out. Um, but that's pretty good so far. A lot of quick time events, but I mentioned earlier the quick time events in Castlevania aren't good. They're very much like God of War, where if you go to a chest and to extend your life, you just tap the button a lot to open the chest, which I can't I can't stand when they do that. Or when to open a door, one out of every twenty doors you have to tap the button, and of course enemies appear and you have to fight them, and then go back and tap the button before the door falls down all the way. Uh, but in Tomb Raider. They do it kind of like a Shinmu, where if a boulder's coming and she has more space on the left, they'll tell you to move the left thumbstick to the left, and so she'll roll that way. So it makes a lot more sense. Um, I could still do without them, but you know, at least they did a, a good job implementing them. Um, so it's pretty good so far. And I still haven't beaten Etrian Odyssey 4. That last boss mm -hmm. is just... oh, uh, you know, I almost dropped it to easy because the party I had was perfectly fine up until the last boss, and then I realized that 
the abilities I had just aren't cutting it. I sent two people to rest, which means you go down two levels, but you your skill points, you can reallocate all of them again. So I tried doing that. still didn't work. I took two characters that I had uh, kind of on the bench, and you can get these scrolls to auto-level them up. So I got those up to 45, and I'm trying to grind those up now to fight the last boss. But one thing the game does most role-playing games don't is there's a level cap of 70. So you can't grind your way to just kind of brute force through the boss. And there's basically a limit to your armor and weapons, which I have the best for each character, and they're almost all at 70. So there's really nothing else I can do. If I can't beat them with these two new characters I'm grinding, there's just no way I can beat this boss, and it's driving me nuts. It's it's the last thing holding me back from really moving on to other games, because I know, I just sit it, see it in the charging cradle mocking me, like, it's just one ten-minute fight away from beating it. That's probably another annoying thing is the fight is so long that when you finally lose, you just kind of want to throw the, the toss the DS down and forget it. I'm done. You know, wasted another half hour on this damn thing. <laughs> but uh, it's still addictive though. I can't I can't not play it. It's just uh, and I also signed up for PS Plus recently, and I have uh, was it Gravity Rush, Uncharted, Abyss, and uh, Mega Man Nine and Ten waiting to be played, but I haven't fired those up yet. And oh, and as uh, Chance mentioned earlier, I, I played Strike Suit Zero recently, which is kind of like a Free Space 2 space combat sim, but they added a, a mech mode where you can transform into a, a big bot. Well, the problem with that is it's not really useful, except for the fact it has a Panzer Dragoon kind of lock-on system where you can shoot multiple missiles at multiple targets at once. Aside from that, there's no reason to be in it. But it's a $20 game from an indie company that was funded largely, or I think almost entirely, through Kickstarter. So it's one of the games that's actually come out. They've Updated it three times with some pretty substantial updates. They added new uh, cockpit views, new effects. They they tweaked a lot of the difficulty um, spikes people complained about. So you know, if someone's interested in that, they should check it out because the developers are pretty active in that. But that was the last thing I beat, and I'm still working on, like I said, Etrian Odyssey. So that's about it that I've been doing recently. Didn't that just that's on to you? Well, see, it's gotta be disheartening, like Dustin was probably gonna say, to just get to that last boss. And uh, I know Dustin, you're going through it too, right? Yeah, I'm. I'm pretty sure that um, when I throw that back in, I'm gonna be dropping the difficulty to easy and just <laughs> hoping to God I can just beat the fuck out of that thing. When I resign myself to to us uh, resting too, because it takes so long to level up the 68 to 70 once you're that high up, yeah. that was tough to rest those. But then to just bench two and take two forty level forty people, that was just that's that's a head hanging shame moment yeah. that I'm also kind of feel like the game's cheating me a little because anytime I have a problem and I look online, everyone says use a rune master. Well I didn't have one, so it seems to me that something's going on and that they if it was that important they should have said, Hey, put the sniper aside, get a rune master, trust me, wink wink, you know. Yeah. It's well, a, see, everyone's I have- viable. Yeah, I have a rune master, and it's I'm still like not doing anything to this guy. It's just like well, what, what I found is the imperial is the only character I have that does mass damage, and I just got to grind him up to seventy, and I should be able to beat it. Okay. But forty-five to seventy takes so long. <laughs> yeah, I one of my characters is just subclass as an imperial. I don't actually have a full-blown imperial. But see, that's the thing about this game that drives me nuts is I feel like. If I make a party at the beginning of the game, I should be able to beat the game with that party. Like, I understand, like, a lot of people are like, oh, I made, like, five other characters and I swap them out and stuff like that. But I don't feel like I should have to do that if I don't want to. Yeah. Oh, I definitely felt that way, too. But I was left with either uh, sticking with that and never, ever beating the game or just grabbing one of the people that joined me earlier on and using the level up scroll to just do what I could because otherwise the party I had who were all maxed out, best armor, best everything, it's that were just not going to do it. They were not doing nearly enough damage. And yeah, it's frustrating when you're using the best spells and you know you're not even close. And you're like, well, at least let me grind up to 80 or something so I can overpower it. But no, they max you at 70 and pretty much tell you to screw off if you, <laughs> you're having problems. Which is so weird because the rest of the game is like, I mean, there was a few places where I was, like, really challenged, but it wasn't like that. Like, you could still beat the enemies. Like, they're, you know... And then it's like you just get to that last boss, and you're like, there's just... It's just a brick wall. Yeah, I found that, you know, as long as I planned well enough, uh, and, you know, for strategy, I could do... I, could, I was beating even bosses that were higher above me, so I thought I was going to go into it pretty well, and not at all. I have just been crushed over and over again. It's uh, It's very frustrating. 
So there you go, guys. Unchained Blades. <laughs> well, see, no, I, 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 I found Unchained Blades to be pretty, pretty easy compared to uh, Etrian Odyssey. And you're, but you're playing on normal difficulty. You're saying, yeah, I'm playing on normal difficulty, and and there's harder difficulties, aren't there? Like I couldn't imagine playing a harder difficulty level. There's someone who beat the game with one character. I don't know how he did it. And there's two videos on YouTube. One is someone beating it with, I think, uh, uh, was it Night Seeker or something? I don't know, with an Imperial in, like, nine rounds. And another person beat it as a fortress in a hundred and some odd rounds uh, or turn match with one character. I have no clue how you play that game solo like that, unless they grind it with a party and left everyone behind. But some people are saying they play the game with one character, which to me just seems like you're just punching yourself in the face over and over. Yeah. Goodness. Wow. <laughs> Wow. I guess I'll go ahead and uh, finish it off here with what I've been playing. Uh, since it's been a while since we had the last podcast, I think I was playing Dead Space Extraction in that one and finished it off. Wonderful, uh, I don't want to call it a light gun shooter because it doesn't really feel like light gun-esque, but just fantastic shooter for the Wii. Did you ever pop it in yet, Dustin, to give it a try? Or Dead Space you picked Extraction? It up? No, I haven't, yeah. thrown it in. I haven't thrown it in yet. That's cool. You're going to love it. It was really cool. So finish that off. Right after that, I went into uh, No More Heroes on the Wii, and man, I, I just love Grasshopper manufacturing suit of 51. Just anything they make is just awesome to me. The character design they use, just the dialogue they put in their game is so hilarious, and the nostalgic throwback in this game to just old school games. Uh, Travis Touchdown's just a stupid idiot, but he's still <laughs> he's got something that just makes him cool as a character. But uh. Just just his designs that they do, Suda51 and everything. Really, really love No More Heroes. So if no one, I can't wait to play No More Heroes 2. I'm trying to space that out and not spoil the whole party at once. And then after that, it was getting close to uh, Bioshock Infinite coming out. And I was trying to debate, I mean, what can I play and start up before Bioshock gets here? Because I know all my time is going to go through that. I know this is the time where Dustin and I was trying to think of something too, playing Vanquish and all, and... I that I hit a gaming funk at that time, and when I when when I see hear those words, it's either you can't figure out what you want to play, or you've put in 20 games or so, and nothing's hooking you. And I want to do a video on that because we've all experienced a gaming funk. I think you were going through it at the same time, right, Dustin? I was. That yeah. was kicking your butt, and we just we were just in a funk of not wanting to really play anything. And so I went into so many games, and I won't list them all, just trying to find something to hook me to get out of that funk, and uh, nothing did, and then Bioshock finally came out and rescued me <laughs> from not being able to play anything to hook me. But yeah, I played Bioshock Infinite, and uh, Dustin, uh, of course, he played that too, and hopefully we'll be able to get in that mini soda uh, talking about it and stuff, because there's so much to talk about the game. Uh, I don't, We don't need another hour and a half tacked onto this podcast, so talking about it. But um, played that, loved it. I dabbled in some... Started up another game I played a lot was Assassin's Creed 3 this month, which uh, it's a series that's really starting to uh, wear out for me. This game, all the past Assassin's Creed games, I really wanted to explore as much as I could in it. And this one, I'm just finding myself trying to fly through it just through to get through the story. I care less about anything else. I don't know why. Maybe it's the setting and characters and stuff, but it's just not hooking me like Ezio and all that with uh, Assassin's Creed 2. So. I'm going to stick to it, though, and uh, get it beat. And uh, hopefully it turns here and gets better, but it's just starting to wear thin. I get, think Assassin's Creed, because we were talking about it the other day. I know it's Assassin's Creed 3, but it's like the fifth game, not counting the ones for PSP and, like, Liberation on the Vita. So there's just so many Assassin's Creed games. It's just starting to run its time out. Also, what else did I play most of? Vita, since uh, Dustin was... I knew he was getting his Vita, kind of worked me into wanting to play some of my video games, and I hadn't beaten Ragnarok Odyssey. So I went back to that, and I realized why I didn't, because I'm stuck at a boss on Chapter 5-9, the Grendel, and anyone who's played it knows what I'm talking about. I cannot beat him. You need help online. I've been trying to wait for Alex. She turned to Mother Base to get online so I can bug him and say, hey, help me beat this boss, because I think he's beating the game now, but uh, he's just never on at the same time, so... Hoping Dustin might get the game to get a little help on it. It doesn't have many people online playing anymore, so it's kind of tough to get people to help you to get past it. But uh, other than that, I downloaded Final Fantasy IX. I uh, got about six hours into that to play that. 
Uh, liking it. Good uh, Final Fantasy game so far for me. I like the uh, gameplay. Died a lot at the beginning of it, but I'm starting to get the hang of it. So, uh, really enjoying that one. And, again, with the Vita, I was playing some Hot Shots Golf World Invitational. I'm starting to get hooked back on that because it's a quick pick-up-and-play game. But other than that, I mean, like I said, I dabbled in a lot of games here and there to try to get hooked on, but I won't list the multitude of games I went through to try to get hooked in. And Raiden Fighter Aces beat all three of those uh, this month, and those are really awesome shooters, so glad Dustin passed that gem along to all of us to let us know to get it. And that's it for me. Hey, Steven. Yes, sir. Right now, as we speak, I am on XSeed's website, and I am ordering the Mercenary Edition of Ragnarok Odyssey. Oh, no, I hope you don't get disappointed. I'm just worried you're going to get disappointed in the game. <laughs> oh, damn. It's, it's, an aw- it's an awesome edition, though, because uh, that Mercenary guy's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah it's I think I said before, it, it, it's like Code of Princess on uh, just 3D. you got to juggle the enemies and stuff, but okay. it, the combat gets really repetitive in it. It's just trying to take down these bosses. It's going to be another Heroes of Ruin. <laughs> it's better than that. It's better than that one. <laughs> okay. But yeah, but, that's about it for me. All right. Well, gentlemen, I think that uh probably about wrap it up. Sounds good to me. Yeah. So, once again, uh, T.G. Apuleius, thank you so much for coming on here. It was a great night. Ah, thanks so much. Uh, really appreciate it, and uh, I'm sure I'll be talking to each of you individually uh, in the near future. But uh, again, thanks a lot. I uh, had a good time. Yeah. And uh, to my fellow co-hosts, always a good time talking to you guys. Indeed. Yes, sir. I'm really glad so, my voice held out. Like, well, I'm gotta say, during my uh, games I've been playing recently, I was about to cough like seven times. So I'm so glad. I held out. And I <laughs> well, just cave in with a cough. Just wait till tomorrow uh, when you wake up and you, you can't breathe and your voice is gone. That's probably what's going to happen. I, I want to say thanks to TJ, TG, though, too, man. One of the nicest guys on YouTube, especially with your giveaway video, man. How the kindness of your heart just giving people stuff like that. I know you hooked me up, you hooked up Chance. Just awesome person. Oh, yeah. So everyone go check him out because really generous and he has a really good channel. So be sure to check him out. Uh, I hope everyone's enjoying their stuff. <laughs> Oh, yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah. I, you, you've been far too generous with me. You should have been like, dude, I don't want to give you any more shit. Quit talking to me. <laughs> you didn't know what you were getting into. <laughs> yeah, but I really appreciate that, man. It's it's awesome. And, yeah, definitely check out his channel. Really awesome videos and definitely going to be quick to respond in great detail to anything that you you ask or, you know, anything that you comment on on videos and stuff. That's that's probably the best part for me. It's like you're just so willing to just talk about things. It's, it's like it's very cool because like, that's, that's kind of what I want, you know, out of out of YouTube, I guess. It's just good conversation. So that's that's really awesome. And uh, oh, well, kind of a much. side note, <laughs> kind of a side note, I, I forgot to mention this earlier. I, I had a guy on YouTube just like come out of nowhere and ask me if he could just buy some of my games. And I'm I'm thinking to myself, and it's like games that I don't want to sell. Like, so what, what the hell do I say to this guy? Um, I, I don't want to sell you my games. <laughs> What's well, like the games that he wanted too were like he wanted Quake One and Quake Two, and I'm like, okay, well you could just go on to Amazon or eBay and buy them for you know like five bucks a piece or you know less than ten dollars a piece. Why would you ask me if you could buy mine? <laughs> Chances gonna get they, chances gonna get peer pressured into selling away his collection. <laughs> yeah, for real. Like I just I kind of felt bad. I mean, he, did, he didn't say anything, and like he didn't have anything on his channel or anything like that. So it, I might have been just a troll. I don't know, but I, yeah, I, I don't dislike your videos now since you didn't <laughs> didn't trade them. I I just thought I'd mention that. You know, no no real answer needed, I guess. I get a lot wait, wait, of uh, people wanting my long box copies. I get a lot of messages for uh, those. Those are pretty popular. I'm surprised that you've sent me two of them now. It's like, oh, so awesome. All right. I would now we're stuck with them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, just as a reminder to everyone out there, uh, remember, uh, write questions on the uh, the comment sections for the episodes because we... Uh, 
I don't think we've had any for the last couple times, so they always add something nice to the uh, the episodes. I'm not that clever. Please ask us some stuff so we have some content. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, it's just going to yeah. be us sitting here twiddling our thumbs. Yeah. My eater's been gone for a little bit, so when he gets back, you know, we'll get some more questions in there. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, gentlemen, I think this is a great time to stop the recording, so I'm going to say good night to everyone. And uh, happy gaming. See you. <laughs> Chance, did you say bye? Bye. <laughs>